Okay, Mr. Chair, we're live. You can begin. All right, thank you. I call to order the July 2020 meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. <clears throat> and uh, very good morning to, to one and all. And um, th thanks to those who are joining us via the live stream video this morning. So I have a quick refresher on our electronic meeting protocol. <clears throat> if you wish to ask a question or make a comment on any item on our agenda today, use the raise hand feature within Zoom, or you can text uh, Jason Langworthy. And uh, staff will help me to keep a speaker's list. And please um, don't jump in without first being recognized. Uh, when I call you, please unmute yourself. If you forget, the board staff will, will prompt you. Uh, and we will continue to keep everyone muted to reduce potential background noise and so that you're not shown on video uh, when you are not the active speaker. All our votes will be recorded by roll call uh, as required by the open meeting law. A reminder, uh, everyone, that although we can't see our audience, today's meeting is live. Uh, it is open to the public via a live stream video and it will be archived on our website uh, for later viewing. And finally, I'll also remind everyone that Mr. Steves will be absent today due to a family medical uh, urgency. So Sarah Dirksen will step in as uh, in Mr. Steve's absence uh, as secretary for our meeting today. So with those uh, preliminary comments, um, our first item of business is to approve the June minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved, so moved. Mr. Chair. Second. I move and, a, and I hear a move and a second. Uh, <clears throat> is there any discussion uh, on the June minutes? Any comments? Hearing none, uh, I will ask uh, Ms. Dirksen to call the roll on the minutes. On the motion to approve the minutes, Regent Anderson? Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson? Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport? Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Herr? Regent Herr is absent. Regent Shu? Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron? Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha? Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 11 yes votes and zero no votes. All right, thank you. <laughs> then by a vote to 11 to zero with one absence, the minutes are approved. Let's move on uh, the agenda. We'll next hear the report of uh, President Gable. Um, uh, President, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Swigum, members of the board. Uh, good morning. I hope you're all healthy, safe, and well. So members of the board, over the last 45 days, our university, our state, really the world has been grappling with George Floyd's murder. As a university, we want to acknowledge the anger, pain, frustration, and concern felt within our community around all of our campuses and beyond. So in response to this, in recent weeks, we've been listening and learning and engaging as we seek to balance our collective wisdom with action so that we can build a more equitable and just university, which is our mission and a direct reflection of our values. There's much work to do on our campuses and also as a member of the larger community, but I wanna reiterate our commitment to that work and to the transparency and shared voice around it. A key attribute of shared voice is shared governance. So in recent weeks, we've been doing active consultation with faculty, staff, and students so that we can work together on how we can improve. The Senate Consultative Committee and the wider Senate has also addressed several proposals that have been submitted either formally through the Senate process informally through regular email communication or via demands that reflect safety, security, discrimination, some policing concerns, and an overall aggregate concern that we play an active role in dismantling systemic racism. As we take these and other important steps together, 
We're committed to centering the voices and experience of our black communities, indigenous communities and communities of color and looking to the leadership of affected communities to guide us. The work is underway across campus also to apply our expertise, faculty, student and staff, our resources, intellectual, financial and otherwise and our abilities to drive action that is sustainable and has meaning it is also a part of the strategic plan. While we certainly didn't anticipate the events of the last 45 days in drafting the strategic plan, the commitment to equity predates it. And so when we get to that point of our discussion later today, I think we'll have a real strong opportunity to discuss how we will develop action items and measures in order to keep this activity going in a meaningful way. In a related uh, matter, um, I want to bring up also renamings. So over the course of the spring semester, throughout the semester, we engaged uh, across our community in an exploration of the draft renamings policy with broad formal and informal consultation throughout the system, which continued uninterrupted despite the challenges presented by the pandemic. And I thank everyone who took the time to meet or talk with us during that very challenging period. But with respect for our community and for the pain, grief and fatigue that we were all experiencing over the last 45 days, we postponed bringing that draft policy before you for action last month. Also in recent weeks and during this period of time, universities from across the nation, from Princeton to Clemson have evaluated buildings and monuments and broadly called the question on how we honor historical figures with complicated pasts and complex legacies. These developments follow related actions that, as we know, we've been discussing for a long time, really over the last decade is when we've seen a lot of this movement um, take shape and really amplify. These times in recent weeks and the longstanding issues they highlight demand reflection. We've decided upon engaging in this reflection that we really need to further consult the draft renamings policy and the amendments that we intended to bring before you. We have a deepened sense of thought that we want to fully explore um, ourselves as the administration and also with the engagement and support of our community on how a campus evolves to reflect and honor the people and things that reflect its mission and values. So with that consultation, we will update the policy and bring it to you for review and if appropriate action this fall. Um, shifting to uh, pandemic related, the pandemic related list. <laughs> the mask policy uh, as an update to members of the board since we last met in June and amidst this very challenging time, the university has taken important steps to address a variety of questions related to the pandemic. On June 2nd, you may recall that we announced initial guidance on masks that strongly encouraged masks at that time. But since then, research and advice from medical experts and public health officials has continued to evolve, most notably with the science really evolving from correlation to causation with the positive impact of wearing a mask being reflected scientifically in that way. And with that deeper understanding, we updated our earlier recommendation regarding masks. And so on July 1st and continuing until rescinded, all University of Minnesota students, faculty, staff, and visitors, including contractors, service providers, vendors, and suppliers, are required to use a face covering at all times when in any enclosed or indoor space on university campuses or properties with very limited exceptions. We're part of a family and we are all part of a solution to keep each other safe and we want to make a commitment to reflect that we um, insist on that safety for our entire family. Uh, another update on Monday afternoon um, ICE or ICE issued guidance specific to the student and exchange visitor program that does not allow international students in the United States to be enrolled in a fully online curriculum and would require any students enrolled in such a curriculum to leave the country. Many of you um, as members of the board and across our community reached out with questions and concerns. This was news that we received along with everyone else when the news broke publicly. So we joined with the Association of American Universities or AAU and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities or APLU in a stand in support of our international students. All universities right now are incorporating some form of online education into their course content and they're doing it because of the pandemic, not for any other reason. And international students shouldn't be penalized for public health measures that the federal government via the Center for Disease Control and our own MDH is suggesting as a matter of safety. 
So in support of our international students, we're reviewing our fall semester in-person and online instruction so that we can accommodate classes to ensure compliance. We're working very actively with our international student and scholar services team on campus known as ISSS to build a coordinated response so that um, the tremendous uncertainty that you can imagine these students are experiencing can be addressed quickly and crisply with answers to their questions. And we're identifying resources to help our international students, including those provided by our immigration response team. And in the meantime, we're working with our colleagues and our delegation in DC to advocate for a different standard for our international students. We're very proud to embrace as part of our university family. Um, over the last month, the university, as you know, has been exploring its entire fall scenarios plan. Provost Croson will cover this in more detail, but just as a matter of update for the president's report, um, all of our campuses are opening this fall with different start and end dates per campus, as we discussed at the last meeting. For all of our campuses and colleges, the fall semester will include an alternative format and multimodal classes, including a proportion of in-person classes all of which will go completely online at the Thanksgiving break so that when students leave campus for the holiday weekend, they don't need to return. There may be some exceptions for specific classes that we would work on with students on a case-by-case -case basis. Any instruction or classwork left to be completed will then be worked out in that manner. This recommendation is based on the work of the Fall 2020 Scenarios Advisory Team, and that team included and consulted public health experts at the university and at the state, as well as our broad university community, including all of our shared governance groups. So there's still additional planning to do. The science is evolving. There are several weeks to go before students would return for the fall semester, and we're taking advantage of that time to make sure that we have an accurate understanding of the best practices and looking for the intersection between those best practices and the timing it would take to launch the programs related to those practices. But ultimately, I know you join me and very much looking forward to welcoming our students back to our campus this fall. But in the meantime, we have stood up what we've been calling internally a July semester which is an augmented summer offering with a focused set of face-to-face -face classes. The July semester has begun and spans the final weeks of the summer session and offers our students, a few of them, the opportunity to take courses that may not fit with their regular academic schedule or to accelerate and catch up on coursework during the summer. A lot of our students were very much affected by the changes in the spring. This gives them a chance to catch back up or to offset their course load for the fall. And it also gives us a chance to run a small curated face-to-face -face session and test some of the practices and procedures that we plan to incorporate with our much larger constituency of students in the fall. On Monday, July 13th, uh, we will start another special legislative session. I wanna update the board that we've been working very closely with the House and Senate leadership on the bonding bill and remain optimistic about its passage. We've also been in regular communication about the challenges posed by COVID-19, including the pandemic's financial impact and how, if anything, the pandemic has accentuated and highlighted the role of a research university during a challenging time such as this, and that a robust bonding bill from the state becomes all the more important in light of recent events. But members of the board, I also want to um, conclude my report the way we have over these last few months with the good news. Um, we've updated you over these uh, last months and really for the last year on how our university family relies upon, merges, amplifies its talents and resources to uplift the university, to serve our state and to impact the world. To this end, we're very proud to call to your attention the partnership we announced two months ago with the governor and the Mayo Clinic to expand statewide COVID-19 testing to 20,000 patients daily, which was met last week. Testing is now available for all Minnesotans who need it, and we're very proud to be a part of that solution. We wanna give two shout outs, first to the hard work and dedication of the University of Minnesota Crookston's business department, which was recently granted official accreditation by the ACBSP or the Accreditation Council of Business Schools and Programs. And a shout out to our Morris campus that just announced that it is carbon neutral with regard to electricity, which we all know is very cornerstone to their overall mission. So members of the board, as I begin my second year as president, I want to express how proud I am to be part of such an incredible community. 
as I um, noted in my recent accomplishments report that I presented to you for review and consideration, I'm very grateful and I feel very lucky to be able to work with this board, the board office, the university community, faculty, staff, and students to be in this community in the state of Minnesota and the role that the state of Minnesota plays nationally and internationally. It's a tremendous team here. Uh, I know of what I speak. This is a tremendous and special team and I'm very honored to be a part of it. So that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. All right, well, thank you, uh, President Gable for that report. And I know I speak for the board when I say that we very much look forward to year two and all the good things that are gonna happen. I'll begin uh, my remarks this morning by reporting on the work of the Presidential Performance Review Committee, which included Vice Chair Spigham, Regent Davenport, and me. The committee met with President Gable on June 26 to deliver her performance review. And as provided in state statutes, that meeting was closed. A summary report has been provided to all regions and is now available to the public. Typically, we would distribute paper copies of this report in the, in the boardroom, but since we're meeting virtually, our report, along with President Gable's report of accomplishments, are available on the Board of Regents website on the July 2020 meeting materials page. I'd like to highlight a couple of points and then I'll invite Regents Swigum and Davenport uh, to jump in with their comments. Uh, we first convened as a committee in mid-May and we met six times uh, uh, as a committee. Our process included gathering feedback from individual regions, as well as university senior leaders, faculty members, students, and external stakeholders. Overall, we were extremely pleased to hear overwhelmingly positive comments from the nearly 30 people we interviewed. President Gable, despite the unprecedented challenges of the pandemic, had an outstanding first year at the University of Minnesota. So with that, if I could ask Regent Davenport uh, for your comments. Thank you, Chair Powell. I'd like to note a few specific elements we called out in the report. First and foremost, President Gable demonstrated decisive leadership in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This was noted by nearly everyone we interviewed. She continues to navigate these unprecedented times with the necessary compassion, steadiness, and adaptability. Second, among the individuals we spoke with, many commented positively on President Gable's visibility and engagement across the university system and state. Her warmth was mentioned frequently, and it's clear she has formed positive relationships with internal and external stakeholders, including legislative leaders, alumni, and donors. Finally, I'll note that President Gable has a tremendous sense of optimism. The university community is excited to see what's next for her tenure and the future of this great university. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Davenport. Uh, Regent Swigum, your comments, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Regent Davenport. Uh, it was fun to, uh, to be part of this committee with you over the presidential review. Um, let me first say that I, th I think almost all of the persons we interviewed uh, mentioned President Gable's energy and her communication abilities of the past year. Uh, They've said the communication with appreciation. Obviously, the energy speaks to itself. Um, I think my comment to uh, President uh, uh, President Gable was that uh, uh, in this time of identity politics, and that's the time we're in now, it's all identity politics, uh, President Gable has quickly became the uh, become the face of the University of Minnesota. And that's a very, very positive uh, th thing for us. Uh, the Presidential Performance Review Committee also identified three priorities uh, for the year ahead. And I think that's important to be looking ahead. Uh, the first of these priorities was to advance the system-wide strategic plan. Uh, now that the board has, uh, has approved the plan, we are looking forward to uh, working with her to bring it to life uh, with, with the measures and uh, to help us track the university's progress in key areas. And that will be part of our uh, retreat coming this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, secondly, uh, it's, the prior, it's, a, it's a priority for President Gable to continue to engage the board 
uh, in understanding the key decisions, the uh, key challenges, uh, the key opportunities, and, and options that the uh, university faces uh, in years to come uh, in higher education, the higher education that continues to evolve. I guess bottom line of that is that uh, of those uh, words would be that uh, uh, we want to make sure we don't read about things in the paper that are key uh, challenges before we uh, have a chance to hear them or discuss them. And, uh, and finally, we've asked President Gable to uh, continue to develop the university's senior leadership team and equip them, uh, actually enhance them to be uh, innovative and visionary. Uh, we noted that our recent selection of uh, Dr. Rachel Croson as provost, provost is an example of an outstanding hire in a, in a critical system-wide leadership role. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, President Gable had a great outstanding first year as president of the university. All right, well, thank you for those comments, uh, Regent Swigum, and thank you, uh, uh, thanks to you uh, and to Regent Davenport uh, for your work on the Presidential uh, Performance Review Committee. It, it is a very good, very comprehensive process, and, and, uh, and we, uh, we, we enjoyed it. Uh, President Gable, thank you. Thank you and congratulations on your first year. We look forward, we very much look forward to working with you uh, in the years ahead as, as, uh, as, as we move forward. Uh, are, there any, uh, are there any other regents who, who, who uh, wish to comment? And if you do, you can use the raise hand feature or alert uh, OBR staff if you wish to speak. And if you, if uh, uh, Maggie or Jason, if you could just let me know if you've got anybody who's interested in speaking. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like we, doesn't sound like we have anybody. Okay, all right then, thank you. Well, I'll just quickly change gears. I have a couple of additional items to address in my report uh, this morning. Uh, later in our agenda, we'll have a discussion about university policy changes that are required due to new federal guidance related to Title IX. And uh, just to, to remind everyone, following today's formal review, it is my intent to call a special meeting later this month for us to take the necessary board action uh, on this important item. After our meeting today, the board and President Gable will meet virtually for our summer retreat. I look forward to a, a very productive dialogue focused on the future of the university and our priorities for the years ahead. So I'll conclude my report now so we can move on to the rest of the important business uh, that's part of this meeting. Item number four is the receive and file reports. Please note that those items uh, are reported in the docket materials. Next, we'll consider the consent report. If you wanna ask a question, make a comment or ask for any item to be considered separately, again, please use the raise hand feature uh, or alert uh, uh, staff and uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent report. So moved. That's been moved. Second. A second. Okay, the consent report has been moved and seconded. And I'll just pause to see if uh, regents, uh, any regent has a question or comment on the consent report. Doesn't sound like there are any uh, questions on that report. And that being the case, I will ask uh, Ms. Dirksen to call the roll on the consent report. On the motion to approve the consent report, Regent Anderson. Regent Anderson. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Herr. Yes. Regent Herr votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. 
Regent Anderson. Okay. Anderson is absent. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 11 yes votes and zero no votes. All right, by a vote of 11 to zero, one absence, the consent report is approved, thank you. We'll now move on to uh, item six, which is before us for action today. Uh, in June, we reviewed a proposed retirement incentive offer in the Finance and Operations Committee, and we have before us today a resolution related to fiscal year 2021 retirement incentive offer. Uh, Interim Vice President Horst is with us this morning. Uh, Interim Vice President, uh, please would you introduce uh, this item? Thank you, uh, Chair Powell and Regents. I'm happy to be with you this morning to discuss the retirement incentive offer program. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. The new retirement incentive offer or RIO is a one-time opportunity for voluntary retirement designed to meet the needs of both employees and departments. The RIO will provide for two lump sum payments into the state of Minnesota healthcare savings plan for employees who are eligible for retirement and select this program. This payment will be roughly equivalent to the value of 24 months of university medical and dental subsidy at 2020 rates. The deposit amount will be split over two fiscal years to minimize the cost burden of the program. The deposit amount will be, will be, will be split, as I said, over two fiscal years, and it will also be based on current estimates of um, the uh, senior health plan premiums for two individuals which will result in two lump sum payments of 19,000 for a total of 38,000 participant. Interested employees must apply for the Rio between August 17th and October 19th of this year and voluntarily retire at a date mutually acceptable to the employee and their unit, but no later than January 15th of 2021. Retirement eligibility is defined by eligibility for our retiree health plans, which includes employees who are age 50 with 15 or more years of service, age 55 with five or more years of service, or 30 years or more of service without regard to age. Those actively working at an appointment of at least 75% and an appointment of nine months or more are eligible. This would include currently about 6,000 active employees as eligible for this program. As we stated in June, historically, uh, we have seen about a 7% acceptance rate in past programs, which if this were to occur in this 2020 population would mean approximately 420 employees would take the program and retire. Next slide, please. The 6,000 employees represent 1,800 faculty, 1,700 professional academic and administrative employees, and 1,300 civil service employees. Additionally, there are 1,200 labor represented employees for which this will be collectively bargained. A requirement of this program would be that no one taking this program and retiring would be rehired at the university for a minimum of six months. Um, we did estimate a backfill rate on the 420 uh, estimated retirees of 40%. Uh, just looking at past programs, and this would be during the first 12 months, which would realize an estimated cost savings of 24 million. And as we discussed in June, this is a broad estimate uh, given past history, and it could be different this time. Uh, backfilling would require an approved exception to the current hiring freeze and cost savings would be retained within colleges and units. Next slide, please. The docket summary provides a more detailed comparison, but this slide does show the main differences to the 2011 Rio. We do have more workforce close to retirement in 2020 than 10 years ago, and we also have a higher number of eligible employees, which would make sense given that. Uh, the salary savings for the eligible population is also higher than in the past. 
given cost of living changes and retention of employees over that time. So the savings or cost avoidance realized should be much higher with the same acceptance percentage. In 2011, the health care savings plan contribution was based on plan premiums of the plan available by location. And under retiree plan offerings, we are doing this in 2020 based on the two-year premium total, as I said, for two adults on a university senior plan, which is consistent with other retirement incentive programs such as faculty phase retirement that we offer. We now use a six-month no rehire period for any retirement that is the result of a tax advantage incentive benefit provided to retire, which is in line with best practice following IRS guidance. With that summary, I will stop and am happy to take any questions on this program. All right. Oh, thank you very much for that overview, Interim Vice President. So now I would entertain a motion to approve the resolution related to the fiscal year 2021 retirement incentive offer. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. So it has been, that resolution has been moved and seconded. And so now we'll open it up for discussion. And again, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or alert staff if you'd like to speak. All right. I see Regent McMillan would like to make a comment and then he will be followed by Regent Swigum. Thank you, Chair Powell. And thank you, Interim Vice President Horstman. I'm in favor of this. And I was when I first saw it last week. I appreciate the, or last month, I appreciate the additional detail here and a little more perspective around the assumptions. I have to say, though, I have a little concern and I'm hoping either you or the President can speak to this. And that is that we have a conservative backfill estimate. I understand that. And that's got 2011 data behind it. And I get all that. I'm fine with that. I think that's probably a good number, but time will tell. And I think it's good to look at history. But the rehire provision in the last box or row in that box that's attached to our to our resolution is what causes me a little concern when considered in the context. So we've got a backfill. We know we're going to rehire. We're going to we're going to replace some people. And then we've got what looks to me, and this is my question though, like something of a common practice at the university, perhaps in higher ed more generally around rehiring. And what I worry about is that if we're going to replace 40% of the people to take this, and we're going to rehire some unspecified amount because there's no number in there from 2011, you know, it just looks like um, this hiring freeze could get eviscerated here pretty quickly. And uh, I guess I'm looking for somebody to speak to the rehiring provision, how likely that is. I get that it comes without benefits, but, you know, what are the numbers there and how common is it for us to uh, jump right back in after six months and hire somebody back? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Regent McMillan. So Interim Vice President Horstman, if you could uh, take, a, take a stab at that one. Thank you, Chair Powell and Regent McMillan. I appreciate that concern. The rehire statement, uh, really, when we look at that from a benefits perspective, is tied to uh, the, the tax qualified incentive provided to retire and having a um, having a actual retirement occur. And the IRS does not provide a time frame for what they would con consider an actual retirement versus what they would term a sham retirement. Uh, you know, they don't tell you it has to be 30 days or six months, but as best practice and what we've looked at other employers, we have usually used six months. That isn't meant to say that the rehire uh, option would be actively opened as a bonanza in month seven. 
Uh, we have a hiring freeze in place. Uh, that is a management uh, decision and a leadership decision as to how we handle that. Of 420 people, if that's the estimate, I'm certain there are some that it would be beneficial to the youth to be back here in a part-time capacity. Um, and there may be critical positions that we uh, also would choose to rehire. What I will also say is all of these programs function together. So the recurring budget savings uh, work in process improvement and shared services should also accompany this program in that there may be administrative areas, for instance, where we redefine how we organize a structure and how we staff it. And so all this could come together to actually uh, increase the savings we get. Uh, but I can't say that all 420 positions that leave, uh, we can say goodbye to and not manage some of that. Obviously, if we hire and replace a long-term employee, the salary and benefit structure could be lower, uh, given less expertise in the replacement of that. So I don't know if that mitigates your concern at all, but that that's uh, the outlook I can see. Uh, Regent McMillan, uh, do you have a follow-up on that? Uh, no, I appreciate that, and I certainly appreciate uh, Interim Vice President Horstman, the idea that there's a whole bunch of other tools we haven't even begun to talk about in here with regard to different uh, ways of, of getting work processes done. So, yeah, I think those are potentially more long-term and more effective uh, tools in any case. But I guess what I'm looking for, and and I think you said this, and I look to the president perhaps to reiterate, is that you know, there's not going to be a floodgate of rehiring going on in month seven and uh, that we're not taking people who are probably working 75, 80% now or a nine month contract and bringing them back to work six months at 40 or just under six months at 49%. I, I know you want the savings here as bad as we do. So I guess I'm just speaking out loud about this region's concern that we, uh, you know, this doesn't become a widespread practice. All right, thank you, Regent McMillan. We'll move on to Regent Swiggum. Regent Swiggum. Regent Swiggum, you're muted. How about now? Am I okay now, Sarah? Yeah, we can we can hear you now. Okay. Am I better being heard or not heard, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> Way better, way better being heard. I uh, I was commenting that my question is going to be very, very similar to uh, Regent McMillan's, uh, Mr. Chairman. But before I go to the question, I, I have to ask VP Horseman, uh, as we look at his video, I see that plaque in the back that says Sweden back there. Uh, VP Horseman, I, I, am I supposed to be anxious or upset or concerned or anything about the domination of Sweden over Norway for the... 18th and 17th centuries, or should I just get over it? I, um, I will have to, uh, Chair, Mc, uh, Chair Powell, Regent Sfigum, I will have to uh, have uh, a uh, call out to my wife. I don't think you have her cell number because she's <laughs> the back, the person who hung that, and she would have to answer that question. <laughs> uh, I, I won't be too anxious over it, okay? <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, my question, uh, very similar to uh, uh, Regent McMillan's, uh, the higher back provisions. Uh, uh, VP Horseman, you said something, and I didn't get it written down, but uh, uh, regarding the back hiring, that it's an approved exception to our current hiring freeze. Uh, uh, there's something you said in regards to our hiring freeze. I, I didn't quite get the words down. Could you tell me about that, expand upon that a little bit, and then also tell me if, since uh, President Gable announced the hiring freeze, I think in the latter part of April, mm -hmm. early May, sometime in there, mm -hmm. are, are, are we rehiring, even though there's a hiring freeze, are we rehiring at about that 40% level to fill key positions? Uh, is, is that about what we have done the last two months? So those would be the two questions. Yes. Um, well, what I, I wanted uh, to emphasize was that um, any request to rehire would 
have to currently go through the hiring exception process, which is continuing until a date to be determined. So any position would require a rationale, a justification, which is submitted to our office and then is collectively reviewed if it's on the academic side with the provost office to see if it is mission critical. If it is an administrative position, we will look at it and see if there's a possibility for job sharing around the university and the like. So this would go through that same process. In regard to where we are today, I do not have updated data from the June meeting, but at that meeting, I think we clarified that compared to the prior year, three month period, we were hiring at about 50% of the rate of the prior year. And I know you had the outlook that we can even do better. Since the beginning of May, we have actually suspended exceptions other than in very rare cases. So we have not had many exceptions coming through. Those that we have hired have been lower cost instructor positions for summer classes, teaching assistants, teaching specialists. So that was a significant number of that 600 figure from the last time, probably half that number. So we have reduced it quite a bit and we can provide a more robust metric around that as we go forward. Okay, just one quick follow up, Mr. Chairman, if I could, just very quick. Yes, please, quickly. I understand the importance of rehiring, filling key positions to the university's success to our mission. Mr. Horstman, in June, at the June meeting, you mentioned that we had a head count at the university of 27,202 employees. I wrote it down, 27,202. Tell me on January 1st, what do you expect that number to be? I will have to follow up with you on an estimate. I would be, it would be a gut reaction right now and I don't think it would do justice. I do know that full-time equivalents of that 27,202 number are approximately slightly higher than 22,000. But let me look at our data and I can provide that to your office and to the rest of the regions. Yeah, please, to all the regions, Mr. Horstman. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Regent Swiggum. Regent Hsu. You're probably muted, Regent Hsu. Yeah, I don't know if someone was fighting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Horstman. I think the numbers that we're talking about are only about 400 based on the numbers and percentages that you're providing. One of the concerns I have, you know, I wanna echo the concerns about the rehiring, but in addition to rehiring, at least in the corporate world, and I know Ken probably knows more about this than I do, but a lot of times someone will take a retirement package and then they'll be hired back as a consultant. And I wanna understand, you know, whether or not that's gonna be a practice that we're going to engage in. If so, what will be the terms laid out in a scenario like that? Because that can quickly eat away, if you're calculating it in your calculations for savings, it's gonna eat away at your savings. Additionally, the numbers that we're talking about are really kind of small, only about 400. I'm not sure how faculty are thinking about it because there wasn't a pandemic in the last scenario in 2011. But could you maybe talk about how the faculty are thinking about these terms and whether or not you know that there are gonna be a lot of people jumping at this or not. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Regent Hsu. VP Horstman, please. Yes, Chair Powell, Regent Hsu, thank you for those questions and comments. In regard to contract hiring, we do have an aspect 
of the uh, hiring freeze uh, process that reviews any new uh, contractual relationships, either with vendor organizations uh, through the purchasing department. We have not had a lot of that activity to this point, but there is a protocol in place to review that that would come into play in this program. Um, in regard to how faculty feels, anecdotally, we have had a number of people, faculty and staff, uh, that likely are looking at retirement in the next year or two or considering phase programs. And when this um, program first was briefly mentioned in May, uh, like any other organization, the retirement uh, talk stops until they know if this is a program or not. And so I do think there is a population typically that is considering retirement in a one to three year time period where this incentive might cause them to want to leave earlier or be able to leave earlier. And that is what you see. I would also say another challenge with these programs is who decides to leave. Um, you know, I, I don't know if this is Chair Powell's experience, but sometimes you have the exact person you hope would remain leave. And uh, sometimes you have areas where you would view that you could uh, uh, accommodate some early retirements and uh, they do not. So that's another part of this process that can be a challenge. Um, but we, we, we do know there are people out there that are, are uh, stalling on other decisions based on this program. And I think that's, that's very typical of this type of uh, program once it's announced. Thank you, uh, Interim VP Horseman. Uh, Regent, Sh uh, Regent Shu, any follow-up on those, uh, any follow-up questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, VP Horseman, um, you mentioned the phased retirements. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that under normal circumstances, we would have people retiring. So what, what are we talking about in terms of um, the benefits uh, for phased retirements versus this program and how many people? Sure. Uh, Chair Paul, Regent Shu, thank you for the follow-up. Um, on an average year, um, based on our retirement data, we show approximately 600 university employees retiring. And of that, probably 40 to 50 of those are phased retirements coming to a conclusion. There are more in process because it can be in anywhere from a one to five year process on a phase. So there are others in process, but it, it adds up to about 40 to 50 a year, historically or over a year. Um, so incrementally, we would see a higher number. Uh, would of these 420, would some of them be in that 600 perhaps? But I would guess that uh, what will cause it to be an incrementally higher number is the fact that people who are maybe two, three, maybe even four years out uh, find a way to make this uh, work for them and, and leave by January. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Interim Vice President. Uh, um, I'm going to move on now to uh, Regent Mayron. At one point you had, uh, you had your hand up, I believe. I would, would, you still, uh, would you still like to ask a question? No, I'm good, thank you. Uh, all right, good, thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, these are really good questions. I appreciate um, our colleagues raising them and they're things that, that popped into my, my head as we talked about this specifically when I saw the part about um, the rehire. Uh, you know, I've seen that in other uh, public entities at the federal level where people take a retirement and then come back and do the same job for um, you know, essentially the same pay, but they're also eligible for the benefits at the time. So it actually it's the same job being performed, but now more expensively by that individual. Maybe there's still cost savings because a new person would have an additional set of benefits. But one of them, I, I guess, um, what's the timing of the savings on this? Because with those lump sums that are being paid, it seems like you know we're kind of front loading it at a time when we're sort of least capable of front loading. How does that impact it versus just maintaining the normal retirement schedule for those same individuals where we're paying on a monthly basis? Um, thank you, uh, Chair Paul, uh, Regent Rocha. That is a very good question. 
In the past, for instance, with phase, we did make monthly subsidies uh, as part of the health plan incentive with the new phase uh, for the Twin Cities policy that was implemented in 2014. We did go to a lump sum much like this one, and it's an all in lump sum one time when someone comes to the retirement date of their phase. With this one, we decided to split it out into two payments one immediately upon retirement and one six months later for a couple of reasons. One is to make sure that we have that six month window because there are bigger problems than a return to work if someone actually does not have a bona fide retirement out of this. So um, we want to ensure that from a compliance standpoint. The other aspect of this is that the second payment does occur in the following fiscal year. So there is payments, but we're trying to spread it out as much as we can into two different lump sums and just one initially. Um, the savings we talk about at a 40% replacement rate of 24 million are over the first 12 months of this program after retirement and uh, do take into account the cost of rehire. If we're able to mitigate that estimate of 40% or we have a higher amount of people that take this program, you know, the savings will be more, but that is already a net figure um, offsetting the savings against the total gross savings against the cost of the replacement in the program. All right, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Inter Vice President. Uh, Regent Rocha, does that address it? Does that address it for you? It, it gets to that point um, to, to some extent, Mr. Chair. I, you know, it'd be again. I'm, I'm concerned the same as, as as the others who have spoken just about the. the you know, it's really that rehire provision and, and ensuring yeah. that and ensuring that this is really getting at helping us. You know, you know, kind of streamline what we're doing as opposed to an opportunity for um, you know other other uh, advantages, um, whether personal or, or departmental. Would it be possible for us to get a report, you know, to, to have a standing expectation of a report, let's say seven months from now as to at the six month mark, whether we start to see a, 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 you know, a lineup of folks seeking to do this so that we can really understand how that, how that interplays with our budget? Uh, Regent Rocha, before I ask uh, Interim Vice President Horseman to respond, I mean, let me just kind of, I mean, that's the question I wrote down to myself. I, I mean, there's clearly very, you know, high interest in this program and the metrics and how it's fulfilled. And, and I think some sort of reporting uh, here over time would be very helpful uh, to the board. Uh, uh, but uh, Interim Vice, uh, Vice President Horstman, do you have any comments on that? We certainly can provide a summary of the activity on this program, uh, the numbers who take at the different employee groups, and we can also monitor uh, and provide ongoing reporting um, as we get six months out on, on what, if any, rehire activity is occurring. We can certainly monitor that and bring that back to the board. All right, thank you, uh, Interim Vice President. Um, I'm gonna move now to uh, Regent, uh, Regent Beeson, and I believe that he is the last uh, person uh, in the queue. So Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, you know, I do support the resolution. Uh, I think it's just one tool uh, in the um, toolbox to um, look at making the university more efficient and effective. My question was really around the same um, sort of reporting um, um, uh, expectation and plan that Regent Rocha and others have, and you mentioned. Um, I think we need to have a report a year out and maybe even two years. I don't want to create a lot of busybody work, but this, we need to inform the future board when we do this again, because the data, the data we have from past undertakings is not, you know, it, it's more anecdotal than factual. I think at the end of the day, we're going to save money doing this, It's a, but we, we need to sort of be able to define long-term how much money we were saving. So I'd like to see extra report that comes out annually for two years. Again, not to create a huge amount of new work for for the for the interim vice president, but this is a this is a research opportunity for us to have for years future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Regent. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, so I'll just make I just have a concluding comment, and then we'll uh, I'll call for uh, call for the call for the vote. 
Uh, I also support this. Um, having said that, I think questions that the board has raised are, are, are very, very good. Um, the reason that, that I support it is that you, having seen a number of these, uh, my view is that they do generate very significant savings. Uh, they do uh, open up the opportunity for different kinds of restructuring that can lead to uh, longer term savings as well. So in general, you know, this is a good, um, this is a good, uh, a good tool, but having Uh, and reporting idea is very appropriate here. And I, I think the uh, interim vice president has, has kind of received that message. And so with that, uh, seeing that there are no uh, additional questions, I'll ask uh, uh, Ms. Dirksen to call the roll. On the motion to approve the resolution related to the retirement incentive offer, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Yeah. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. <clears throat> yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha? Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 yes votes and zero no votes. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dirksen. So the resolution passes by a vote of 12 to zero and the retirement incentive offer is approved. Our next uh, item is, is action uh, on two real estate transactions that were reviewed at the June Finance and Operations Committee meeting, the purchase of 501 Oak Street Southeast Minneapolis and the sale of 1.66 acres at Umore Park in Rosemont. There have been no changes to either transaction since our review in June. We'll take each one separately I'll first, act for, uh, first ask for a motion, followed by any questions uh, or discussions, and then the vote. Uh, and Assistant Vice President uh, Leslie Krieger is here and ready to respond to any questions you, that you might have. And so let me begin by asking uh, for a motion to approve the purchase of 501 Oak Street Southeast, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'll move. Uh, second. Thank you, Regent Chu. Uh, there's motion and a second. Uh, and let's see if uh, any regions have comments or questions on this transaction. Sarah, do you see any? I don't see any. All right, then uh, there being no uh, questions or comments, uh, I'll ask Ms. Durgeson to ask for the vote. On the motion to approve the purchase of 501 Oak Street Southeast Minneapolis, Regent Anderson. Regent Anderson? Regent Anderson? Regent Anderson is absent. Regent Beeson? Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport? Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her? Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu? Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron? Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha? Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair Powell? Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 11 yes votes and zero no votes. All right, 11 yes, zero no, one absent. That motion passes. Thank you very much. So we will now move to the second sale, which is the 1.66 acres uh, at Umore Park. Um, could I have a motion to approve that sale, oh, no. please? And it's moved, and is there a second? Second. second. All right, any comments? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Dirksen, if we could move to the roll call on that. On the motion to approve the sale of 1.66 acres at Umore Park, Regent Anderson. Regent Anderson. 
Regent Anderson is absent. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum. Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 11 yes votes, one absent and zero no votes. All right, by a vote of 11 zero and one absence, the sale of 1.66 acres at Umore Park is approved. Thank you. All right, now we'll move on to our next item. Uh, today, we will have a formal review of a resolution related to amendments to the university's sexual misconduct policies. I wanna remind everyone that these changes are required under new federal Title IX guidance. And joining us for this item are Tina Marisom, Director of the Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action, Deputy General Counsel Brian Slovak, and Professor Ned Patterson from the College of Veterinary Medicine. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we turn it over to our three speakers, uh, President Gable, would you like to provide comments on this topic? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board. Um, as the chair mentioned, in May, the Department of Education issued final Title IX regulations that will take effect on August 14th. These regulations specify how institutions must address reports of sexual misconduct covered under the provisions. The mid-August deadline leaves us a very short window to revise our policies, procedures, and practices in order to be in compliance. And all of these measures, even when approved, will take some time to complete and implement. But during this process, even in the summer, and even during the pandemic, we've been very committed to broad consultation across our university community so that we could develop together the best way to implement the required changes. Tina Marisam, our EOAA Director and Title IX Coordinator, and Brian Slavitt, our Deputy General Counsel, along with Ned Patterson, Professor from the College of Veterinary Medicine and FCC Vice Chair, have been working really tirelessly and are here today to present a resolution that relates to how we need to revise university policies and procedures so that we are now in compliance in time to meet the August 14th deadline. I want to express my sincerest thanks to them and to everyone who engaged in the consultation for their good work within this condensed timeline. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, President Gable and presenters. Uh, we'll turn it over to you now for your uh, comments. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spigum, Regents, and President Gable. Good morning. Uh, our aim today is to present the key draft revisions that have been made to university policies and procedures to bring them into compliance mm -hmm. with the new Title IX regulations. During the June board, board discussion on this topic, we sought your guidance on three key questions. And since then, we've continued to consult extensively with the university community on these and also on other questions related to implementation of the regulations. So we'll use our presentation time today to describe how the draft amended policies address those three key questions that we discussed in June. Uh, and then also to present one draft change to the sexual harassment definition that's not directly related to the new regulations. Next slide. At the June meeting, we discussed that the university currently applies different sexual misconduct grievance procedures depending on whether the respondent is a staff, student, or faculty member, and in some cases, depending on the respondent's campus. None of these grievance procedures currently comply with the new Title IX regulations. Uh, based on the board's guidance, as well as on other stakeholder feedback, the amended policy creates a single compliant grievance process for sexual misconduct matters that applies to all employees and students system-wide. To do this, the revised drafts of the policy on faculty tenure, the policy on conflict resolution for faculty PA, civil service, and student workers, and the civil service employment rules have been amended uh, to state that decisions and disciplines related to sexual misconduct will now be addressed under the administrative policy and procedure on sexual harassment, sexual assault, stalking, and relationship violence. With respect to our union employees, 
Uh, there will be bargaining regarding the proposed carve out of sexual misconduct matters and application of a system wide grievance process. We believe that adopting this single grievance process and the sexual misconduct matters will avoid the duplicative, duplicative efforts that would be needed to run different hearing processes across campuses and across employee classifications. And that a single grievance process will also promote consistent outcomes in sexual misconduct cases across university populations. Over the past month, faculty governance has consulted with stakeholders and has drafted a proposal to amend the board policy on faculty tenure so that it states that sexual misconduct matters will be addressed under this single compliant grievance process. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Ned Patterson will present this proposed amendment to faculty tenure. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sligam, Regents and President Gable, as Vice Chair of the FCC, I've been designated to organize the faculty consultation to these changes. This slide shows what is required for an amendment to the Board of Regents policy faculty tenure. Before board action, any amendment must be submitted to the faculty senate for its advice and recommendation. And the faculty senate is to seek recommendations from several faculty committees as indicated on this slide. Normally an amendment to the tenure policy would be consulted in a slow and deliberate fashion and not during the summer when governance activities are generally on hiatus, but we're in 2020, so everything's different. Um, with an urgent timeline for changes, we have compressed thorough deliberation into a short time span. There has been robust consult consultation in the last month. For the tenure policy specifically, this includes the three committees indicated on this slide, as well as the SCC and the FCC, the leadership of the Minnesota chapter of the American Association of University Professors, a working group of faculty with extensive governance experience, and also a work group convened by TINA of administrators, faculty, staff, and students. The need for a tenure policy change to comply with the Title IX changes was also discussed at a combined faculty and university Senate meeting on June 29th. Although the tenure policy amendment itself necessarily deals with only sanctions against faculty, we have consulted not only with faculty, but with student and staff leaders as well, with the aim of reaching a consistent, fair, and equitable results for everyone. Under the current tenure policy, allegations of sexual misconduct may be considered under section 10.2 of the tenure policy, which addresses disciplinary actions against faculty, including termination or suspension of a faculty appointment before its expiration, as well as minor disciplinary action. Section 10 then mandates that section 14 <laughs> procedures be followed to impose major discipline. That's with the Senate Judicial Committee and the Dean and others. That is termination or suspension of a faculty member. Sections 14 and 15 provide for Senate Judicial Committee consideration of appeals by faculty of any sanctions imposed under section 10. As already indicated, applying tenure policy provisions on sanctions to sexual misconduct claims would not be in compliance with the new Title IX regulations. The faculty members and committee members who have been consulted on this issue considered two options for amending the tenure policy to come in compliance with the Title IX changes. Option one would be to amend the tenure policy to provide for Title IX compliant hearings within the tenure policy itself. That would involve extensive changes to sections 10, 14, and 15. Option two is to make an exception by the means of a carve out that Tina just referred to for allegations of sexual misconduct. Next slide, please. That is the path being proposed and that has been the, has had the support of those who have been consulted on the proposed changes. This proposal is to add the following text to section 10.4 of the faculty tenure policy as a carve out. There is no section 10.4 yet, so this will be added. As you can see in the slide, Notwithstanding other provisions in these regulations, the process for decisions and appeals regarding disciplinary action in response to complaints against faculty for alleged violations of the Board of Regents policy indicated will be conducted under the indicated administrative policy. The administrative policy at the bottom will provide that a faculty party complainant or respondent will have the opportunity to select at least one member of the hearing panel or that there will be a faculty member on the hearing panel if a faculty member is the party. 
The proposed carve out of sexual misconduct allegations, removing them from the tenure policy is the same strategy being proposed for other sexual misconduct allegations as Tina indicated. The tenure policy amendment addresses how panels will be chosen to hear complaints in which a faculty member is involved. Ensuring that there will be a faculty member on the hearing panel or a faculty member who's a party to a complaint can choose one of the panel members. That provision is important to faculty if this new hearing process replaces the tenure policy process to maintain a faculty voice in the decision-making process for sanctions. From our consultation, we understand and expect that the same mechanism will be provided or similar mechanism for all complainants and respondents. In the next week, there will be additional consultation and feedback, then a special combined faculty and university Senate meeting is scheduled for July 15th. We will include a formal advisory vote by the Faculty Senate on the proposed tenure policy amendment. Deputy General Counsel Slavit will next present more details of the proposed amended policies. Next slide, please. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spigum, um, Regents and President Gable. Um, at the June meeting, we discussed uh, that the new regulations require the university to choose either the preponderance of the evidence standard or the clear and convincing evidence standard, and that the same standard must apply to all sexual misconduct cases. Based on the board's feedback at that meeting, as well as the proposal to amend the tenure code from the faculty consultative committee and other consultation as well, the draft policy is before you adopt the preponderance of the evidence standard in all sexual misconduct cases. Um, next slide, please. During the June meeting, we also presented the question of whether the university should move to a system-wide grievance process. Based on the feedback from the board and feedback received during the system-wide consultations, the draft policies before you include a system-wide sexual misconduct hearing committee. This committee would consist of faculty, PNA, civil service, and labor representative staff and students from all five university campuses. A committee secretary staff member would provide administrative and scheduling support to the hearing process system wide. The committee members would serve as panelists in sexual misconduct hearings and would receive significant training. We have had consultation sessions where we discussed panel related issues, including how many panel members uh, there should be and how those panel members should be selected for individual hearings. Um, this slide represents one potential model for the panel makeup, but it is not the only path under consideration, but generally is the framework we envision. Hearing panels would be made up of one hearing officer, a professional staff person, and would consist of a total of three or five members. Consultation has appeared to show greater support for three person panels, but there's also an advocacy for five person panels. We think further consideration and consultation is appropriate here. We envision one of two methods for selecting individual panels. The first option would be each of the parties select a panel member from, avail from available committee members. This method has been preferred by some of the faculty with whom we have consulted and some involved with other conflict resolution processes on campus. The other potential method would have the committee secretary selecting the panel members with each party they'll have in the right to have a panel member of their same classification, that is student, staff, or faculty on the panel. This latter method with the committee secretary um, selecting the individuals is strongly favored by those who work in student affairs in the university system. Um, they cite a number of reasons in support of their view, um, including avoiding uh, bias selections or the appearance of bias selections based on committee member identity whether that be based on race, color, religion, gender, or otherwise. Avoid the perception that a member selected by a party will not be impartial in the hearing. Um, they believe it will increase the ability to have diverse panels, and also that it will avoid placing parties, including students, in a position of selecting a panel member without having any real factual basis for making that selection. Um, some have also voiced privacy concerns. I'll note that this is the process that is having a secretary select the panels that we currently follow in student discipline matters. Um, either selection process would ensure that a faculty member party, as an example, 
would always have the opportunity to have a faculty member panelist as a decision maker, whether that panelist is selected by the party or appointed. And either selection process aligns with the faculty consultative committee's proposal for amendment uh, to the policy and faculty tenure. Now under the grievance process, the panel would make the determination and responsibility in all sexual misconduct cases. That is the panelists would determine in all cases whether the respondent engaged in sexual misconduct in violation of university policy. In cases of student respondents, the panelists would also decide the disciplinary sanction if any to be imposed. This is what panels currently do uh, in student disciplinary matters. In cases with employee respondents, the panelists would make recommendations for disciplinary sanctions to the dean, the vice president, or the vice chancellor overseeing the respondent's department or unit. Um, next slide, please. At the June meeting, we also presented the question of what should be the scope of, of advisor participation in hearings. Based on your feedback, the draft policies in front of you provide for full advisor participation in hearings, which is also the model we currently follow in student matters on most of the campuses. We note for you that there is no consensus on this issue in the university community. Um, student affairs professionals in our system have generally supported more limited advisor participations for reasons that we discussed in June, including the concern that full advisor participation can discourage reporting and can create an intimidated environment for complainants. There are two additional advisor related questions related to the regulations requirement that the university provide advisors to any party that does not have their own advisor. Um, just um, to go back to that issue that we discussed in June, the regulations are very clear that if at any point um, a, a party does not have a advisor, the university must appoint one. Even if a person had one and then shows up at a hearing at the last moment without an advisor, the university must be ready to provide an advisor, at least to provide, uh, to cross-examine the other party. So the two questions are, um, when should the advisor be provided? Um, just for the hearing as the regulations require, or should they be provided during the entire hearing process, which would be, include the pre-hearing and the hearing, or in other parts of the process as well, such as the investigation stage and the appeal process? And then the second question is who should serve as advisors? These questions raise very practical issues regarding resources and budget, as well as significant policy issues relating to equity and fairness. As to the equity issue, we will be faced with situations where one party, and usually it will be the respondent, will have an attorney and the other party will not have their own advisor. And the university will need to assign an advisor to that person. Ideally, the advisor provided by the university would have the skills, experience and training to effectively present that party's perspective uh, and conduct direct to cross-examination the hearing with an attorney on the other side. As to resources and budget, depending on the path followed, the cost of providing advisors could potentially be very significant. It's difficult to assess this at this time, however, because we cannot say with any certainty how many hearings there will be under this new system and how many parties will need advisors. It will take time, um, months I would expect, after August 14th to make, make a good assessment here. But we do need to address the issue now because we will need to start providing advisors um, soon after August 14th. We suggest that the university needs trained and skilled individuals to serve as advisors for the hearing process. That is preparation for and handling the pre-hearing and the hearing. The first question will be, at least in the short term, does the university have current personnel to fill these roles of advisors? If we cannot find sufficiently skilled and experienced individuals um, with the bandwidth to take on these roles, then the university will need to look to add additional professional staff. Um, I'll note that we currently have an office in the Twin Cities campus, Student Advocate Services, that serves this role for students charged with violating the conduct code, including those accused of violating the sexual misconduct policy. The advocate um, in that office for the students estimates that he spends between 40 to 60 hours per matter, meeting with the students, um, communicating with witnesses, preparing exhibits, arguments, and presenting at the hearing themselves. 
There has been, and I expect there will be continued discussion of potentially expanding the role of, of this office. Um, in closing on this topic, I'll just note um, this issue presents our university and all universities uh, with, a, with a great challenge to figure out the best way to, to handle this in terms of resources and equity and continued, continued consultation here is definitely needed. Uh, I'll turn this back to Director uh, Marisam and next slide, please. Thank you. The regulations require that we offer an appeal process for complainants and respondents. Uh, we currently offer such an appeal process in cases involving student respondents. In cases with employee respondents, we currently provide processes for those employees to challenge discipline that's imposed as a result of a sexual misconduct violation. However, in those cases with employee respondents, we don't currently provide a process to appeal the finding of responsibility. The regulations require that we offer three grounds for appeal in all sexual misconduct matters, um, which are the first three bullets on this list. Uh, procedure, procedural irregularity that affected the outcome of the matter. Um, there's new evidence that was not reasonably available at the time that determination was made that could affect the outcome of the matter. And that grievance process personnel had a conflict of interest or bias that affected the outcome of the matter. The amended policies add two additional grounds for appeal, which we currently offer in our appeal process in student cases. They are, first, that the decision on responsibility was not based on substantial information. And the policy clarifies that substantial information means relevant information that a reasonable person might accept as adequate to support a conclusion. And the final ground for appeal is that the sanction was grossly disproportionate to the offense. The amended policies identify appellate officers uh, for all students and faculty on the Twin Cities campus. The appellate officer would be the provost or designee. For staff on the Twin Cities campus, the appellate officer would be the vice president for human resources or designee. And for all community members on the Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses, the appellate officer would be the chancellor or designee. Overall, the draft revised policies that we've shared provide a system-wide process and structure for implementing the regulations that aims to most efficiently and cost-effectively meet the new needs of all five campuses. Still, the new regulatory requirements, particularly those to provide live hearings in employee matters and to provide advisors to parties who don't select their own, create new roles that we need to fill. And our next step will be to identify personnel who can fill these new roles. In, in particular, we need to identify individuals to serve as professional hearing officers, individuals to serve as advisors to the party, and an individual to serve as secretary of the hearing committee. Uh, we will first be looking to current staff members who may have the expertise and capacity to take on some of these roles in addition to their current job duties. But even so, we anticipate that additional hiring will be necessary in order to implement all of the regulatory requirements. Next slide, please. So the final policy amendment that we'll cover is the addition of sexual exploitation as a type of sexual harassment um, in, in the board and administrative policy. Uh, this addition is not required by the regulations. Rather, it's offered to improve the clarity and effectiveness of our policy. Um, we've included the proposed definition of sexual exploitation on the slide. Among other things, it would explicitly prohibit university members from recording or distributing pictures or videos of sexual activity or, or nudity. In situations where the university member should reasonably have known that this conduct would be unwelcome. Our current policy already describes this and other types of sexual exploitation in a list of possible examples of sexual harassment, but our current policy doesn't explicitly include sexual exploitation as a type of sexual harassment. In part, this proposed addition of sexual exploitation as a type of sexual harassment reflects the impact of social media and also of smartphones with cameras on the interactions between our community members. And also that institutions are seeing increases in misconduct that involves recording or distribu distributing recordings of private sexual activity in order to harass, harm, or intimidate the person shown in the recording. We want to ensure that we provide clear notice to our community that this conduct is prohibited. And this change would also bring the university into alignment with the policies of our peer institutions. 
among our Big Ten peer institutions, all but two, um, Wisconsin and Nebraska, have policy provisions that explicitly prohibit sexual exploitation. So those are the, the key draft amendments to university policy that we wanted to present today. Uh, we look forward to your comments, questions, and feedback. All right, I would like to uh, thank uh, the presenters. I, this is uh, uh, you know, quite, um, quite a, a, a heavy lift. There's been a lot of work done here, and I know that there are a lot of topics. I also know that um, many of you, uh, of my fellow regents, will want to comment. Let me remind everybody that uh, today we're having a discussion of the material that you just heard, and again, we'll call a special meeting uh, later in the month uh, for the purpose of a board approval uh, of the of the revised of the revised policy. So um, I'm going to open it up to a comment and discussion now. And I know that uh, uh, Regent Beeson would like to comment. Regent Beeson. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, presenters, for all the work. Uh, we it feels like we're moving toward a um, a um, good resolution. Um, the I'm not clear about the number of cases that we would expect to have that will inform the the um, sort of the budget impact. Um, um, I wonder whether there is a sort of simplified sort of approach to where both parties agree to not engage advisors or attorneys and that, that that becomes one route. Maybe there are no simple cases and that that's not realistic. Uh, another thought I had was um, in terms of who should be advisors is engaging our law school students who are being professionally trained in this area and whether they would be willing to do some pro bono work or paid work for um, functioning in these um, we do need advisors. The, you've raised a good question about to what extent you know, are advisors going to be investigators and where does their work start? When does it stop? I guess I don't have any strong opinions um, about that. I need to think about that. The um, um, as to who can select the advisor, I agree that we that the complainant or um, Defendants should be able to have somebody in their own classification, but I don't know that they should be able to pick the specific person because that might create some obligation on the part of the person selected. So anyway, I think uh, it is really good work and um, I look forward to voting in favor of it when we see it again uh, later in the month. Thank you, staff. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for that comment, uh, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you, uh, presenters. Uh, uh, I really appreciate all the work put into this, too. I have a, <clears throat> just a basic question and then a couple, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that we're a student misconduct, where the student is, has violated. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. The student, where the student has uh, done some, uh, some kind of uh, uh, misconduct. The panel decides what the, this, I think I heard that the panel would decide what, if any, disciplinary action uh, should be administered. Uh, the question is, is there a history of disciplinary action for similar cases? And it kind of goes into my next thought. Uh, any concerns about racial discrimination through this process? All right, you've, uh, you've heard the uh, Regent Simonson's questions. Uh, 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 um, Director Marison, may, I don't know if you want to take that or, or, or delegate, but anyway, if you've heard the questions, if we could have a response. Thank you, Chair Powell and Regent Simonson. Um, it has been the case um, to date that in cases where a student is alleged to have violated the sexual misconduct policy, that the same panel that determines the, whether that student is responsible for violating policy also determines um, the discipline. Um, we do provide guidance to that panel to try to promote consistency of cases and also to address any potential implicit bias that might come into decision making. And we provide guidance in two ways. Um, first of all, we have sanctioning guidelines um, that are provided to the panels. And second of all, we, our office 
or our student conduct offices propose an informal resolution prior to the case going to hear it, and propose disciplinary action that they and their um, from their position of expertise and experience as student conduct professionals believe would be appropriate given the conduct. So the panel members have both those sanctioning guidelines as well as the advice from professionals in our student conduct offices. Um, as to the question on racial discrimination, I mean, that is something that we are always thinking about. The hallmark of our process is to provide an impartial and unbiased process. Um, we, in terms of selecting panel members, we work very hard to have a, a wide diversity of panel members with different backgrounds. Um, we also ask the panel members to um, talk about their neutrality and how they think about potential bias when they apply to be members on the Twin Cities campus of our hearing panel. So we, we do take steps to try to, to, to emphasize our commitment to unbiased and impartial decision making. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director Marison. Uh, Director uh, Regent Simonson, does that address uh, your questions? Yes, yes, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. And uh, as has been noted, there are a lot of work here and great appreciation from uh, this region. And I know the full board for the amount of time and effort in a compressed time frame that uh, this reflects. It does feel like we're, we're, we're moving ahead here, not at light speed, but something close to it. And uh, there's a lot to digest. I appreciate the, you know, this is the second time we've gotten to touch it and a third meeting will help. But uh, a couple thoughts and then a question in all this. I, I fully support a more streamlined, centralized approach. And I think as we continue to deal with, you know, an almost endless and continuous growth in this compliance arena you know it could be it, whether it's research and contract grant administration whether it's human subject research oversight whether it is sexual misconduct we continue to have more and more places where we need to invest resources to to do the compliance function correctly and this is another i think we do our best and most efficient work when we do that in a centralized manner but i say that with this caveat and i very strongly say this we have to resource the outstate portion of the university appropriately. I think the, you know, the ability to find a panel, the ability to find advisors, the ability to do any of that is probably exponentially higher on the Twin Cities campus than it is in any of our four um, system campuses. So we've got to be thinking about where those people come from and how they find budget you know, space to do that in uh, systems and I'm not picking on anyone here. I just know there's more people, there's more access, there's more student and more demand in the Twin Cities, but uh, just think about the system as we do this. Now, here's my question. Um, practically speaking, what what's the willingness and interest and availability of panelists to do this work? And And I know we want and I want the most diverse panels we can find. Um, we want panelists that are willing to step up and do it. As we think about the various ways to go and create, you know, the processes, whether the secretary picks them, whether someone else picks them, whether they self-select, can, can one of the three or maybe several of them speak to who's willing to do this? Who's willing? And I'm not talking about advisors. I'm not talking about that. I'm just asking Panelists are super important. They are the jury. And if we have to keep going back to a small pool of diverse panelists that we may have in the faculty or on the professional staff, you know, how long are they going to be willing to do it? And uh, how often are they going to be willing to do it? And are we making it something that uh, faculty members and staff members want to do? Or is it going to be looked upon as a as you know drudgery that nobody wants to do this because it's hard and it impacts lives? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent McMillan. Uh, Director Marison, why don't you take a shot uh, at that? And then uh, any, any of the other presenters who'd like to jump in, please do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Regent McMillan. And I, I appreciate your comment about the needs to make sure that all campuses are well resourced in this area. And we have heard in particular from Crookston and Morris and Rochester campuses that they do need assistance to fill new 
roles that are created by the regulations. And our aim is to have a system-wide pool of panel members, of advisors, and of hearing officers that can all the campuses, while still allowing all campuses to have individuals serve on those panels. Um, in terms of your question about who we think these panelists might be, <clears throat> we do have some experience. Um, I can speak to the Twin Cities campus in particular, where we currently have a committee that serves as panelists in our student cases. Um, and the way that we select panelists now is that the, the provost sends out a call for applicants, and we um, ask applicants to apply and to talk about their relevant experience partiality and we also look at factors of diversity and experience in selecting that committee um, and in the past we have had plenty of interest of individuals faculty students and staff who are willing to step up and serve on the panel um, which is quite a testament to our community because this is very time consuming work it's also emotionally laborious work um, one one key part of our proposal is to have the hearing officer on each panel there'll be one hearing officer that will have that as part of their professional role um, which will allow them to be the ones to write up the decision, which is now under the new regulations, there needs to be quite an extensive written decision. Um, and also to be the person on the panel who knows the regulations back and forth, backwards and frontwards and can um, you know, make the technical evidentiary determinations, which we think will take some burden off of the other, the other panel members. That's a comprehensive, thoughtful answer. Thank you. I don't have any follow-up, uh, uh, Chair Paul. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a tremendous amount of work in a, a compressed time. Um, just a, a, a few observations, and I'm also likely going to. Um, I, I, I reached out to the board office. I know there was some uh, personal issues the last couple of days, and so um, I wasn't able to necessarily get a couple questions in to, to get them answered on more of a technical matter, but. Um, uh, so in, in the intervening days, I may have some additional questions uh, and clarification. Um, you know, my concern, I understand we have another meeting, but that meeting is really up against the deadline. And so, you know, we won't have a whole lot of opportunity, I don't think, to, to um, address things in a way that allows the consultation that we want with others uh, around the university. So um, I, I do think that the time is, is somewhat now um, to, to get to some of the bigger issues. You know, one of my concerns, when we talk about consultation, and I, I know there's this is just an incredibly difficult task. Um, I, I'm always nervous about consultation with different groups because I don't know what they were consulted about. And I don't know what they saw. Was it in this forum? Was it in a previous forum? And so, you know, I'll, I'll be very interested in what various groups of folks uh, will, will, will think about this, you know, whether it's um, advocates for, for victims of sexual harassment, sexual assault, or whether it's the defense bar. I mean, just different people that can give you different perspectives to say, here's something that you might want to uh, take into consideration as you as you put this forward, um, but there there are a number of things. You know, when we uh, I understand we're we're talking about going with the lower standard um, with the preponderance versus clear and convincing, um, and you know, taking it theoretically that that has the impact that it should on the on the decision makers. Um, you, you know, I I I'm still kind of hung up on this issue about what the sanctions are what sanctions are available when you go at the lower standard. It seems that we'd be more reserved in the sanctions available. If you're going to have a more draconian standard, then it would be a a, a higher a draconian sanctions. Rather, you would need a higher standard. Um, and I'm not really clear how those marry up just yet. Um, so you know, that's may, maybe I'll I'll be able to have a again a subsequent dialogue to understand that a little bit better. I don't know that I'll get that taken care of here. But um, one of the things I when I was reading and I think in the presentation, and I, I want to make sure that I'm uh, catching this right. When it talks about uh, being able to select someone for the panel in the in the in the, the tenure code portion, um, when I first read that, that was a bit of a of a um, it stood out to me because I think the point of the of the federal change is trying to create a a, a fair process that applies to all people within the institution that that one group isn't isolated by you know in this case tenure whereas others you know don't have the same opportunity and, and not even just so much in terms of the respondents, but in terms of the potential claimants um, in that, you know, a claim against other categories of university community members, students, staff, um, a, a complainant has a, a, a better process, whereas if it's then against faculty, it's very guarded. I want to make sure that, that 
that what we're talking about, whether it's the same category of individual, um, it really ought to be a similar or, uh, you know, as it, it should be the same across all categories. And when we start to talk about, um, um, you know, a person in this category being able to pick someone for their panel, I understand that it's a majority vote. Um, it's a majority vote on a preponderance standard, if that's accurate. And, and so, um, you know, if you're talking about a panel of three, you know, suddenly you start talking about it. Well, then the other thing that, that concerned me when I read it the first time, and I hope that's not the case, is that if the, if the accused is a faculty member, the faculty member gets to appoint someone to the panel. But if the claimant is not a faculty member, they wouldn't be able to. And so now, you know, you, you're talking about whether your selected person um, is able to sort of bring along the jury, so to speak. I, 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 I find that very odd that, the, that somebody, that a party in the matter would be selecting their own jury. And, and, and so I'm, um, if we are going to move forward with that, I want to make it clear because the language in the, in the uh, materials wasn't clear as to whether it was, they have to be given that option, whether the ultimate result is going to be one or the other. I just wasn't clear on where we're going with that. So I'm very interested in what that looks like. Um, with the other amendments on the sexual exploitation, um, you know, I get it. Um, I think it's important. I understand that it's it's somewhat the norm among other institutions or most institutions. I don't. When I saw that, I was kind of taken aback because we've got enough to figure out with this policy shift to, to now take on this whole new topic. I, you know, I would have maybe preferred that this had been a, a September October uh, conversation. Uh, but within that, I, I did see some uh, some things that that kind of stood out. Um, I think there's really good stuff in there, really important stuff. Part of the challenge is um, whether those definitions will capture innocent or consensual behavior. Um, and, and I just wanna make sure that we're, we're tracking that. I won't necessarily go through all of this, but we've got some issues about private body parts, uses the term private body parts that I didn't find that definition elsewhere. Um, there, are, there is a reference in another place to what body parts would constitute um, improper contact. There's also uh, uses the term sexual touching that I didn't, I don't think that was defined elsewhere. And I, I think that that would help us avoid some conflicts and some challenges in the future. But like I said, so some kind of real tech, kind of technical stuff coming forward. Um, and then, and then the other thing is a lot of the other changes, it would be very helpful for me to understand whether they're being um, brought over from a different part of a different policy or whether they're wholly new, because there was a lot of, a lot of new material in the red line version. And so it was hard for me to necessarily, you know, I don't want to come and say, well, what about this? And then you would come back and say, well, that's already in this other part of the policy. And I just wasn't aware of it or wasn't tracking it because I wasn't as comprehensively aware. But um, that being said, you know, I, I would, I would again, hope that students, uh, victims, advocates, um, you know, those that have experienced defending accused, I would hope that all these groups will be in, will be consulted as we get ready for our next conversation about this. Um, I also strongly believe that whatever we come up with should be as close to identical among the claimants and respondents as possible. Right now, I see some pretty significant differences. And, and I think that, that um, while it may not violate the letter of the new changes, it would, I think, kind of get to the spirit of the new changes and wanting to make sure that, that uh, the institution is treating the, this issue with the same um, uh, gravity as uh, regardless of who the, the, the actors are involved. So. I'll leave it at that. I'm sure I'll be sending some, uh, you know, some some correspondence to try to get some more uh, clear answers. But uh, those are my thoughts right now, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Regent Rocha. Thank you for those for those uh, comments. And um, and I think the uh, the three presenters understand that there will be some continuing, you know, conversation and dialogue with you to kind of chase down the answers to um, these good questions. Thank you, um, Regent Davenport. Uh, thank you, Chair Paul. Um, I echo some of the concerns that were already raised, um, Regent Rosha, about um, the selection of the faculty member. I agree with having uh, faculty on that hearing committee so the faculty voice is there, um, but question the um, kind of self-selection of that. Um, I echo uh, Regent Beeson's um, thoughts about the role of law students, um, and Regent McMillan's concerns about panels and um, having the capacity because these are intense kind of things. Um, 40, 60 hours for an advocate um, is a lot of hours and unfortunately uh, probably necessary. Um, I wanna comment about the sanctioning guidelines. The tool that the university has is an excellent tool. I've used it myself and have um, applied that 
and really does bring consistency to sanctions. Um, and my question is, um, under these new new um, the new policy, based on experience, would um, would you anticipate um, resolution prior to hearing? A lot of times, these these things do get resolved along the way in the process, um, but the increased intensity of this um, makes me wonder uh, about workload. And what are thoughts on um, how that might um, shrink or expand? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Davenport. Uh, Director Marison, will you take a swing at that, please? Sure. Thank you, Chair Powell and Regent Davenport. Um, in terms of your, your question about informal resolutions or a resolution that resolves the case prior to a, the entire hearing, process. Um, those are permitted under the regulations. Um, they're only permitted in circumstances where both parties voluntarily agree in writing to the informal resolution. Um, the regulations don't allow those informal resolutions in any case where a student makes a complaint against an employee. So in any case where a student makes a complaint against an employee, it needs that the, the, the the um, entire hearing process needs to be used. Um, in those cases where we're allowed to offer informal resolutions, we do have that built into our process. And that the way that that will work is after the campus Title IX office completes its investigation and sends the investigative report to the hearing committee, the hearing committee secretary will reach out to the, the right university authority. In student cases, it will be the student conduct office. And in employee cases, it will be the, the, the person who would impose discipline and we'll offer that person the opportunity to offer the parties an informal resolution that they could both voluntarily agree to and then the case would stop at that point. Um, we want to also look into other types of informal resolutions that we can offer, including those um, along the lines of restorative justice. Um, what we do know is that most people don't report sexual misconduct and even those that do, the vast majority don't wanna go through our grievance process for a variety of reasons, but in part because of the kind of emotionally intense nature of it. Um, so we are working on that informal resolution piece, which we see is very important to our overall sexual misconduct prevention process. Um, in terms of workload, um, workload will go up. Um, you know, for the office that I oversee, for the investigative office, there are so many more requirements. There are more steps in the process. Um, the workload will go up as as well as case timelines, um, just because of the, the opportunities that we now need to give the parties to respond in writing um, and the number of days we need to give them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Mayor Sam. I'm going to uh, move us along here. There are a number of others who want to speak on this list, so I'm going to move on uh, to Regent Swiggum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, and I'll be very, very brief, very quick, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and the, my question was centered around the Regent uh, uh, Davenport's last question about workload. Uh, uh, I know both uh, uh, Attorney Slovet and Director Marisham mentioned uh, the need maybe for more staff, the need for uh, more personnel. Uh, I need to be convinced about that. I need to, uh, in, in light of the hiring freeze, uh, in light of the furloughs that we uh, applied, in light of the Rio that we just talked about uh, a half an hour ago in light of the tremendous budget difficulties, as important as this is, um, I'm, I'm not, I need to be convinced, Mr. Chairman, about, about hiring more personnel, more staff, uh, as important as this issue is. And I, I just lay that out that I still need to see some more numbers, facts, need information. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that uh, comment, Regent Swiggum. And if I could just maybe amplify uh, Director Marison a little bit on that. I mean, I think if you could help, if you could just take your best guess based on, you know, the number of, um, the number of, of, of cases uh, that you think we might have and the way they're going to have to be staffed in order to get them resolved, you know, under the, you know, under the, this new regulation, just, I think if you could give us some rough feel for what it's gonna take um, to be compliant uh, so that our eyes are wide open, uh, that would be very helpful and it would help address uh, Regent uh, Swiggum's uh, concern. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair Powell and Regent Swiggum. Um, 
So the estimate that I can give is we have the system-wide numbers of sexual misconduct investigations that we had in fiscal year 2019. So they've, cha they've changed a bit over the past year. But in fiscal year 2019, I believe there were 68 sexual misconduct investigations system-wide. So under the new regulations, unless there was an informal resolution in those cases, would go forward to the hearing process. Um, so we anticipate, you know, somewhere depending on how the, on whether our reports go up or down, depending on these new regulations or where, whether people are more or less willing to use our investigation process, depending on how many cases get informally resolved, I would anticipate we'd have, um, you know, between 40 and 60 hearings a year that we need to staff. Um, in terms of um, the options that we have to staff these cases are one, for the hearing officer and for the advisors, we could potentially try to rely on volunteers. You know, we could, as we do for the other panel members, we could put out a call and try to coordinate a pool of volunteers and give them, you know, minimal training, maybe two full days of training, um, and put them in these roles. That would be the most cost effective option. Um, what that would mean would be that we would have, you know, a volunteer who is put in this role of hearing officer, potentially when we have, you know, attorneys um, involved and who would have to on the fly make evidentiary determinations that comply with the regulations, kind of control those hearings, make sure that they're a safe place for the parties to present their sides and also to um, write a compliant written determination. Um, in, in terms of, I, and I would say that what I understand from our peer institutions in the Big Ten is that um, I think all of them that I have talked to and everyone is just planning right now, but are planning to go with a professional hearing officer, um, often someone who's an attorney. Um, okay. Also, risk of, of having someone not know the regulations well enough in that role. Um, in terms of advisors, we could have a pool of volunteer advisors um, to provide to the parties if they don't bring their own. That is really a valued decision for our institution. We will absolutely be faced with cases where the respondent has an attorney and we have a complainant who's coming into a hearing to talk about a potentially traumatic and you know, very private sexual activity and you know, be scrutinized by a panel, which is you know, an extraordinary ask of a complainant. It's stressful for both parties. And to provide that complainant with someone who is a volunteer and doesn't have any experience in conducting direct and cross-examination, um, I think would be widely perceived and probably would create an unequal playing field um, in, in, in the hearing. Um, so that is why, you know, my, pref my strong preference would be that we are able to provide professional advisors to the parties, people who are staff members who as part of their job serve as advisors and who have experience. I think first we'll look to see if, if we have current personnel who can take on that work within our institution. Um, I have some doubt whether we'll, we'll, I'm not sure whether we'll be able to find individuals with the relevant skills currently employed who would have the bandwidth to do that. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Director Marison, and thank you for your willingness to, to, to think on your feet on this topic. And I know you need to do a little more, you know, work, work on it, and you've given us some options. And maybe between now and then you can, you know, uh, kind of bring this to ground and give us a tighter range for what it's going to cost to do this right. Uh, Regent Swigum, any follow-up? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, I, I did miss some of the um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Patterson's uh, report, so um, please forgive me if I ask a question that uh, was answered already. Uh, number one, I'm not sure that I am in favor of supporting a lower standard in in, um, in the ultimate uh, uh, approval of this. I, I do have some questions regarding uh, questions from the last meeting. Number one, uh, what are we doing with the backlog of cases? Uh, I think I asked this question last time, whether or not these new um, procedures would apply to the old cases. And I, I don't know how many old cases there are, but I think there might be hundreds um, of old cases. So 
I guess I'll start there. Uh, and is there uh, a general limit to the length of time that these investigations will take? Obviously, um, there's, I think these cases will take longer uh, with the, especially with the uh, uh, requirement of a written report. So I, I would ask that uh, whatever we decide that we have some reporting um, that would take place similar to the last discussion that we had um, regarding uh, the retirements. We'd like to see some kind of reporting uh, on the Title IX investigations. Uh, regarding the uh, idea that we would be appointing panelists or ha allowing the, the people involved to appoint their own panelists, I don't think that's a very good idea. And if I look at the presentation, uh, the presentation clearly says each panel has three members, but yet um, when the discussion uh, where the presentation was actually taking place verbally, uh, it was said that it would be three to five, potentially three to five members and that no decision has been made on that. So I think it kind of conveys a different thought than what's actually written in the presentation, which makes it difficult to really understand where we're going on this. But I think uh, to, ha to allow people to have advisors, that, that is uh, an excellent approach. I think everyone should have an advisor, but for people to be placing their own um, friends uh, on, on the actual hearing committee, I think is problematic. Um, so I, in, in fairness, uh, I think fairness is important. I think uh, uh, how much we're spending is important. So I would, I didn't hear a number, but I'd like to know kind of how much we're spending on this in terms of dollars uh, today and what, what we're projecting to spend in the future, if, if in fact it's more. Uh, another point I'd like to make is uh, I kind of see that we're, we're trying to throw a bunch of stuff into this. Uh, I would like to see us uh, approve in, at our special meeting only the required aspects of the changes and then leave for another day the non-required uh, changes, I guess, mostly definitions and things. I think more time and thought needs to be put in into that. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Chu. And I know that some of those are sort of comments and, and you know, requests for information later, some are questions. I, I'd like to ask uh, Director Marisam, you know, to your last, uh, to Regent Chu's last points, um, are there some elements of, you know, of the material you put before us today that we could, we could take up as a board later? This is, there's a lot here. And is there anything that we could defer uh, to a later meeting and focus really for the special meeting just on what's required by, to be uh, in compliance with the title, the new Title IX regulations? Uh, thank you, Chair Paul Regent Chu. Um, yes, I would. The vast majority of the changes are either required by the regulations or they're related to the regulations that we need to make kind of um, additional changes to make the regulations work well. Um, the one piece that is not related to the regulations is adding um, sexual exploitation as a subset of sexual harassment. We could absolutely put that off until a further meeting. Right now, we do list sexual exploitation as examples of sexual harassment in the policy, so we're not completely uncovered there. And that, you know, that is solely offered to clarify the policy and is not related to the regulations. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Um, and we said so we'll take that under advisement that we might want to defer that. And I thank you for that uh, comment, Regent Chu. Uh, Regent Mehron. Uh, thank you. I I'm going to uh, walk my comments or questions through the slide presentations um, where questions were asked of us or proposals were in front of us, just so I make sure I cover everything. Um, um, the, the first one that I'm looking at is the uh, Faculty Consultative Committee's proposal uh, regarding the additional text to 10.4. Um, I, I do think that uh, if we are going to uh, allow a faculty party, whether complainant or respondent, to the opportunity to select at least one member of the hearing panel, then I think the same uh, process or um, opportunity should be provided to any uh, individual, whether they're a student or a staff member. So I, I'm 
all in favor of making sure that we are applying this whole uh, procedure consistently, let's see, consistently among all of the different constituencies who are affected by this policy, whether they're faculty, uh, staff, or students. Um, I, I think that what Brian said, Slavit said, was that right now the uh, proposal, the amended policy on who the panel would be made of would address uh, that concern that was put forth by faculty in that, as I understand it, whether it was a panel of three members or five members, that one panel is selected by each party from a list of available committee members. I think, Brian, and if you could confirm what you were saying, is that would address then uh, the faculty's proposal, but also allow then students to select uh, presumably a student if they wanted to from uh, available hearing committee members uh, and similarly for staff. But I, I wanna make sure I understand that, but I do think there needs to be parity among all of the groups. Um, I do think applying preponderance of the evidence is the way to go. It's, I think, again, we need to be consistent. Uh, it's, I, I would suggest it's also consistent what happens legally under federal and state law. If there was a, a, a lawsuit involving a claim of sexual harassment or uh, sexual misconduct, uh, for lack of a better term, preponderance of the evidence is what is used. And I do think it should be applied consist consistently among all of the groups. Um, I, I um, it's interesting about uh, the suggestion on the amended policies. Each panel member has three, and I think Brian did say possibly five members that uh, different groups were proposing three or five. Um, the proposal right now in front of us does have one panelist selected by each party from a list of uh, hearing members. Um, uh, you know, I think of if we have a three person um, panel and uh, if it's a claim of sexual harassment or sexual misconduct by a student against a student, conceivably you could have a three person panel made up of two students and per, or perhaps a, a hearing officer who is not a student. I, I, somehow, when the, if the panel is that small, um, making these kinds of decisions on responsibility and ultimately disciplinary actions, I'm not sure it is appropriate to have those decisions being made where two out of three might be potentially students. I was reacting, um, so I've got some questions about that. I do understand you're proposing uh, to a system-wide hearing committee to serve as decision makers in the live hearing. My recollection is when we had the presentation um, last month about this, when it was first previewed, that we talked about perhaps that it would be good if all the investigations were also centralized as well. As I understand it, and I'd like to hear from uh, whether it's Brian or, or, or Tina, are, are we talking about investigations will continue to be conducted campus by campus? I do have a concern about consistency um, my, and also cost savings. Would it be, uh, could we save more if all investigations, all hearings were centralized um, throughout the entire system for all five campuses. Um, in terms of full advisor participation in hearings, um, I just wanna make sure I understand, I understand you're suggesting that there be full advisor participation in hearings for everyone then what is it about the other portions of the grievance process that you're excluding from having full advisor participation or not offering full advisor um, participation? So I think I need a, a, to understand what's been excluded. Um, I will say, I do think we need professionals uh, for, and the university needs to be prepared to offer professionals as advisors. I think these issues are too important to both the complainants and the respondents to have basically amateurs who are not uh, trained in this. I think the concern about having a level playing field is critical. And if one individual is bringing in an attorney, the other individual not being able 
to have an attorney, but being given a, uh, whether it's a law student or somebody else who's been trained for a couple of days, I do not think is adequate. I don't think it's fulfilling the important responsibility that these regulations contemplate. So I think we have to bite the bullet and be prepared to offer uh, up professional advisors uh, to the extent that they are being used. Um, and uh, to be honest, I am fine with the, the addition of sexual exploitation as defined here in the amended policies and also the change proposed language on um, what's included in the appeal process and offer on appeal process for complainants and respondents under what situations you can appeal, adding that new language about the decision on responsibility was not based on substantial information. I think that that's an appropriate change. So those are uh, my comments and then uh, hopefully uh, the presenters can address the questions that I have. And and Regent uh, Regent Mayron, um, maybe if you if you would just recap the key questions. You know, I heard a um, uh, question about centralizing investigations. Um, I heard not only from you but from others. You know, real concerns. You know, with what we're calling picking your own journey, uh, your own jury, and uh, you know, and so if we're looking for commentary on that. There's a, you have a real concern just about making sure that there's comparability and fairness across different groups and individuals. I'm paraphrasing you now. Am I capturing some of the key questions and maybe you could add so that the, the uh, presenters can address your, your, your main questions? Sure, uh, I think you did. And I think that the, so, uh, so in terms of questions, um, uh, I think you, you have captured them it, with the exception of uh, also, if, we're, if the proposal now is that we have full advisor participation in hearings, what is excluded by not uh, providing full advisor participation in all components of the grievance process? All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Mehron. Uh, Director Marison, maybe you can you know, take a swing and, and, and phone friends as needed to address um, these good questions. Thank you, Chair Paul, Regent Mayor. Um, as to the first question about centralizing the investigative function, um, we are almost fully centralized right now. EOAA, my office, can, uh, sexual, fairly, pretty much all sexual misconduct can, investigation system-wide, except for the student cases on the Morris campus and the Rochester campus, which I, I don't think there have been any in my time on the Rochester campus. So my plan is to meet with the Morris and Rochester campus and offer the option and have a conversation with them about whether it would be a beneficial service to have EOAA um, do those investigations as well. So that consultation process is still ongoing. Uh, as to the second question about um, advisor participation in parts of the, the grievance process other than the hearing, um, currently and our proposal going forward is that advisors can um, attend and accompany parties to all of the meetings in the investigative process. Um, we ask the we allow the advisors to ask questions about process at the beginning of the meeting, um, to take breaks and consult with their um, with the parties during the meeting. Um, but while we are asking questions during the investigative process, we ask that the, advi the advisors not participate and that we can have a conversation directly with the parties, even though the advisors are present. And then after we're done asking our questions, we give the advisors an opportunity to then um, ask clarifying questions of the parties so that we can capture any information that maybe we missed or that needs to be clarified. Um, so that's advisor participation in the investigation. Um, right now we have full advisor participation in the hearing um, and then the advisor can also help the party with any part of the appeal, which is a paper appeal. Um, as to the, the last um, question, which has come up among from many regions about the idea that we have panel members um, or that we have parties select their panel members from a list of committee members. Um, just to clarify, the proposal would not allow a party to select a panel member that they knew or had any relationship with. There would still be conflict of interest and kind of anti-bias and impartiality principles that would apply. Um, the purpose when that was initially proposed was to provide, um, was as a fairness element for the party 
be able to select someone of their employee class or who they felt could most impartially hear the case. Um, since we submitted our slides, given that our consultation is happening in real time, we have heard from community members many of the concerns that have been expressed by the regents about allowing selection of panel members, um, that it will be a burden for parties, that it will be confusing for them, that they might mistake that this panel member is going to be on their side rather than an impartial person, um, that people might so impermissibly or inappropriately select panel members based on identity. Um, and so we are continuing, we, uh, all of the comments here are appreciated and I expect that we will go back to our community and um, in particular be talking about the other option of having um, the secretary appoint panel members, but allowing both parties to have the opportunity to have a panel member from their class, employee or student or faculty. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director Marisam. Uh, Regent, uh, Regent Mayron, does that, does that help and get at some of your, your core questions? I'm just looking here uh, to see if it does. Um, I, just a follow-up question on the uh, current situation where advisors are attending uh, um, other parts of the grievance process other than the actual hearing. Do you have any sense of how much that is taken advantage of by one side or the other? In other words, again, the concern being that there is an unequal playing field as, as um, in, advisors can make sure that information, if they're trained, is getting brought out uh, during an investigation, which someone who does not have the benefit of an advisor um, may not have uh, that good advice. And so uh, is there, the concern being, is there an unequal playing field that one side or the other tends to have an advisor and the other side uh, uh, is in some sense being short shrifted? Director Marisam, could you address that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Regent Mayeron. Um, in many cases, it is true that the respondent has an attorney advisor and the complainant brings a victim support advocate from our Aurora Center or other local office who doesn't have the kind of training in eliciting information. Um, what we have done so far to address that kind of imbalance um, for equity concerns is that right now on four of our campuses, we have a university presenter who presents the case on behalf of the university, kind of in the role of a prosecutor. Um, and that is a member of our student conduct staff, or if there's an attorney, if the respondent has an attorney, a member of our general counsel's office will present the case on behalf of the university. So they're not an advisor to the complainant, but they're generally eliciting the types of information that an advisor to the complainant would elicit. So that process has been a big help for us in maintaining that even playing field and, and equity. Um, our assessment is that the new regulations will not allow us to continue that process we will no longer have a university presenter. So it will be all the more important that we're able to provide um, kind of trained advisors who are able to be effective um, in eliciting information on behalf of their party. Um, Deputy Council Slavic, did I, you're more involved in that process than I am. Is there anything you wanna add? Um, no, that sounded right to me. All I right, just have one follow-up question, uh, Chair Powell, and that yes. is um, when you talk about the cost, this has been brought out and you were asked to give an estimate on the potentially the number of hearings that might ultimately ensue and therefore the costs uh, for professional hearing officers or advisors. My memory is when you did the presentation to the new regents uh, last week on how things currently work. Um, that in fact, very few of the formal complaints end up in a hearing, have ended up in the past, ultimately going to hearing. And so when you were giving an estimate, if there are approximately 40 to 60 complaints, formal complaints a year, potentially you could have that number of hearings based on our past, am I remembering this correctly or incorrectly, that in fact, very few of those actually ended up going into a formal hearing. Or Director Marisam. 
Um, thank you, Chair Powell, Regent Mayeron. Um, that's correct. At every step of the way, people, um, complainants decide they don't want to go further. So from the number of reports we get, very few complainants want to move forward to an investigation. In fiscal year 2019, we did have 68 cases that went to investigation. And so unless um, the investigation was halted for some reason, which would be very rare, or an informal resolution is reached, all of those cases would go forward to hearing. I don't have the exact number of how many cases in which an informal resolution is reached. Um, maybe half at the mo maybe half is my kind of, is my on the fly guess. All right, thank you very much. Thank I'm going to move on now um, to our final questioner, uh, Regent uh, Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, presenters, and everyone else who's commented. Thanks for the important work. Um, I have a few comments um, in a question or rather request at the end. Um, I, I do support the preponderance of evidence uh, standard as others have stated. Um, I also agree that, you know, um, members should, should have someone of their classification um, present in the, in the hearings, but not necessarily pick them. So I think I'm in agreement with everything else there. Uh, the, the three to five number, um, I guess I just want clarification on which one it is. I, I think there's a benefit in having uh, more people um, if they're available and if we're able to consistently you know, provide that number. I think Regent Mehran alluded to that. I also see the value in the centralized process, um, but not necessarily in centralized execution, if that makes sense. I think the process um, should be standard. And, um, but you know, especially in the, in the case of a hearing, um, when people show up to a hearing, it should be people from their campus or at least representation of it. I, I don't know how comfortable a student or, or staff member would be showing up and, and you know, the, the three or five folks are, are from uh, across the state without the contextual knowledge of that campus or maybe where the events happened or things like that. Um, and then I, I also see the value in advisors um, but certainly, I mean, it brings up the equity, the equity issue that's that's uh, very high on my mind, especially um, Director Marison just said that with the new process, there will be no university presenter. I think it's uh, even more important then. Obviously, the as others have pointed out, that there's a cost to that, um, and and we don't know what it is. But uh, you know, there shouldn't be a situation where one party. Um, has access to an advisor and the other one doesn't. So if that's something the university uh, has to address, then I, then I think it is. And then lastly, uh, I guess, I, I think others have said it as well, but I, I would just like more feedback on this um, on from the university community as a whole. On page 100, um, all the groups that were uh, contacted and... and, and um, consulted were listed. And I think that was a very thorough uh, list. I don't have an issue with that. Um, it's just the part of the process in which that was, right? I imagine we didn't have uh, a draft policy available when some of those conversations were happening. And I fully appreciate the, the nature of this and the, and the squeeze timeline we have um, with this. But, you know, just it's an important topic. And also just, I guess, being aware of, of, of who this affects um, and and who I am and who you know a lot of us are on this board. I mean, sexual assault can be can occur by anyone and and anyone can be a victim. But uh, we know it happens to women more. We know it happens to transgender people and, and stuff like that. Uh, more non-binary students and whatnot. So you know, I I just with a limited perspective, I would appreciate more feedback. I I think I'm thinking of the process that we implement with uh, the budget. Um, in which the budget is put out there and then there's a call to the university community and we receive those pages and pages and pages of, of written uh, feedback. I think that'd be very valuable here, whether the board office or the president's office would coordinate that um, before our, our upcoming special meeting. I think that's something we could put out where we could sit and, and read um, what students, what staff members, what faculty are saying, or maybe it's survivors who've been part of the process and are saying, you know, this is the issue I had with the process and this change makes me feel this way or respondents or, or people who, I don't know what that would look like, but um, just with the importance of this topic and understanding my identity and, and just my limited perspective on this, um, I, I think it'd be appropriate to put out that formal call 
for feedback. Um, appreciating that we have a deadline and that's why we're doing it at this time. Um, but, you know, with folks, you know, being um, their minds being elsewhere with COVID and, and people not physically on campus, um, I think we should take that extra step to solicit that feedback, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Regent uh, Kenyana. Uh, Director Marisam, any thoughts or, or reactions to Regent Kenyana's comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Paul, Regent Kenyanya. Um, as to your questions, um, the first one seemed to be about the number of panel members. Um, we have considered having one panel member, one kind of hearing officer, as many as our peers are doing, having three or having five. Um, we were concerned about the possible implicit bias that could come, um, having one, only one panel member. Um, then we considered three or five. Um, five would provide a more opportunity for diversity on the panel. Um, there are some logistical challenges to having five panel members, um, and some of the feedback that we've gotten on that is that it would be, for, it is difficult for the parties to um, tell their story of what happened um, and be scrutinized by the panel, and that it might be especially intimidating to have five panel members sitting there rather than three. Um, so both that went into our consideration in suggesting three panel members, but we're, we're, we're still consulting on this in real time. Um, in terms of wanting campus representatives on the panel, so there's someone from the campus community as a decision maker, um, I doubt that we're going to be able to have five different hearing officers, one on each campus with the requisite skills and experience. Um, but I would anticipate that we could ensure that there is some representative of the campus on the panel. And I know that um, in particular, UMD has been requesting that and we're gonna continue to, to work on that piece. Um, in terms of your great suggestion of getting more feedback from the community, I absolutely agree. I think it is troubling to all of us to have to implement such sweeping changes, especially when you know folks aren't on campus. Um, I have been in touch with the policy office and we are um, to request that we put out the policy for a 10 day review um, after this board meeting so that we'll have the feedback before the July 30th meeting. Um, I'm hoping even though folks aren't on campus that we might um, be able to get some more feedback that way. All right, very good. Uh, thank you, Director Marison. So um, we have heard from everyone who, who, who has a, a comment now, um, and I, I want to thank um, the board for the very good questions and, and the um, members of staff for their, you know, very thoughtful responses. You've done a lot in a very short period of time. And we're, we're very grateful, but we also, I think, recognize that this is a heavy lift and, and clearly there's more work to do. Um, and we understand that. I also, I want to just um, call out um, Professor Patterson and his leadership uh, with regards to the faculty, you know, on this and how quickly the faculty Senate and the various consultative committees and groups within the Senate, how very, very quickly uh, you know, they have moved on this issue to align the faculty, you know, with the proposed policy. Uh, we're very uh, uh, aware of how long it can typically take uh, for things to move through and how quickly this has happened. And um, I think it goes without saying that we're very grateful. And we really do. We really do appreciate uh, Professor Patterson and the faculty and their work on this. So with that, um, I'll remind you, special meeting on this later this month. Uh, the, the questions, I think, have been very good, and we'll be working to address those. Now, um, we are going to uh, take a five-minute break, uh, and then we will come back to our uh, 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 next topic, which is the University of Minnesota Alumni Association uh, annual report. Um, that's a discussion and a report, and uh, we will uh, we will reconvene at exactly 11:30.
All right, we're going to come back to order here. Sarah, are we, uh, have we come back together here? Are we ready to go? I am taking a quick look here, Mr. Chair. We are all mostly here. I think we can go ahead. All right, very good, thank you. Thanks everyone for, re for returning now here on time. We're turning now to item nine this is the annual report of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. And I wanna welcome uh, our presenters uh, for this item, uh, the UMAA president and CEO, uh, Lisa Lewis is very well known to this board, Laura Moret, the fiscal 2020 uh, board chair and Mark Jessen, uh, the fiscal year 2021 uh, board chair. Uh, I will just say it is always a pleasure for us to welcome uh, Lisa, you and your and your board leaders uh, 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 to uh, to the board of regents. We look forward to hearing your your report, and uh, we'll turn the floor over uh, to you. Thank you, Chair Powell, and I believe that our um, 2020 board chair, Laura Moret, is going to start us, and we can start All right. with the slide. All right, I'll, I will start us off, uh, Chair Powell, President Gable, and members of the board of regents. Good morning, um, thank you for inviting us. I'm Laura Moret, a proud alumna and mother of an alumnus. I have two degrees from the University of Minnesota, a BA from the College of Liberal Arts and an MBA from the Carlson School. I also have a law degree from another Big Ten University, which I will not mention. Um, I, when I'm not volunteering for the university, I'm a managing director and Chief uh, Counsel of Piper Sandler Companies, formerly uh, Piper Jaffrey. I'm here today with Lisa Lewis, as you mentioned, our UMAA President and CEO, Mark Jessen, the owner of Jessen Press, and he will, he will serve as the board chair next year. It's really been an honor to serve as the 81st chair of the UMAA Board of Directors. In the last year, uh, we've been part of a university that has had many highlights and many challenges. Um, today, um, we'll reflect on a few of the highlights of the year, the state of the alumni relationship with the university, um, our current work uh, related to COVID-19 and our plans for next year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Throughout the year, I've had the opportunity to see the very best of the University of Minnesota, uh, from strong leadership and President Gable, to student activism and adaptability, and to uh, faculty and staff um, working on the cutting edge of COVID-19 research. And we've also had alumni around the world contributing to the success of the university. Um, this year, we welcomed the university's 17th president together. We recognized alumni service, and we cheered the Gopher football team to a historic season. Uh, the Alumni Association has advocated for the bonding bill with the legislature. Um, we've also had to adapt to COVID-19 as the rest of the university has. And we have stood up against systemic racism and injustice following the death of George Floyd. Uh, this year I've witnessed firsthand the importance of the university to the students, the alumni, the state, the country, and the world. Uh, the Alumni Association staff and volunteers have worked tirelessly this year. Uh, we've been bringing the university to alumni and we're bringing the alumni voice into important university conversations such as the strategic plan, the university budget, and legislative advocacy. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa Lewis and let her talk about the highlights and our plans for the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Chair Powell and members of the Board of Regents, it's been a year that has called upon us to be nimble, to listen, and to innovate. The UMAA has stepped up to that challenge to find new and creative ways to engage alumni, to support students, and to advance the university. 
I'm pleased to share the state of the alumni relationships with the university remains strong and continues to grow. So let's start by looking at a few numbers. Next slide, please. The latest snapshot of the U's alumni community shows that there are now 596,000 alumni system-wide. And while many live across the country or in other parts of the world, the majority, 63%, choose to stay in the state and contribute to Minnesota's vibrant economy. These alumni reflect the outcome of the university's teaching mission and extend its reach to communities around the world. Next slide, please. And the majority are engaged. 373,000 alumni connected to the University of Minnesota in their lifetime and 270,000 engaged in the past year. Lifetime eng engagement increased by 2% over last year and annual engagement increased by 5%. This data gives us a sense of the breadth of the alumni relationships. It tells us how many people we're reaching through various forms of connection and serves as an indication of alumni interest in staying connected to the university. These numbers also represent an extraordinary amount of work across the entire system in communicating and engaging with alumni. I'm grateful for the partnerships with the alumni relations officers and the schools and colleges and on each of the campuses, the president's office, our hundreds of volunteers around the world and the UMAA staff, faculty members and so many others who maintain relationships with our graduates. Alumni relations is truly a team sport. Next slide, please. And we know that engagement leads to giving. In FY19, more than 38,000 system-wide alumni gave over $214 million to the U, representing 59% of all donors and 53% of all gifts. Alumni have continued to play a major role in the success of the Driven Campaign. And when we look a little more closely at the numbers, we see that engagement really matters to giving. 47% of highly engaged alumni made a gift to the university, compared to 1% of alumni who are not otherwise engaged. And highly engaged alumni also give more. In fact, they gave an average of $5,000 annually to the university, compared to $700 for those who are not engaged. Next slide. Our engagement growth comes from terrific volunteers. And this year, alumni have stepped up to form three new networks, student government, the Muslim Alumni Network, and the Pride Alumni Network. Each group is connecting new alumni with programs that are relevant and meaningful to them. Next slide, please. The individual interests of the 496,000 alumni varies greatly, and the UMAA's 85 networks are a crucial engagement point to alumni based on where they live, where they work, what they studied, or what they care about. Each of these networks represents the university in their communities. They connect to hear faculty and alumni speakers, serve their communities, recruit students, cheer the gophers, or speak out when it's most needed. Next slide, please. This year was also an opportunity to reflect on our past and how it has shaped our present. The UMAA and the university partnered with Twin Cities PBS in the production of This Free North an important documentary about University of Minnesota Black history. In February, over 900 alumni, students, faculty, staff, and community members gathered in Northrop for the premiere. The documentary was followed by a panel discussion on what comes next for communities of color, especially Black students at the university. Events like this remind us that history is complicated, divisive, and ongoing and we must continue to learn from it to grow and create a better future for all. If you'd like to watch or rewatch this Free North, it's available through our UMAA website. Next slide, please. And when the calendar turned to March and COVID-19 disrupted our world, the UMAA didn't slow down. We quickly shifted to a strategy based on community and utility. In a time of isolation, we wanted to bring alumni together digitally and keep people connected. With in-person events canceled, the UMAA continues to engage alumni in a digital first strategy where all of our events are currently virtual. This has allowed us to reach more alumni around the world. We also recognize that alumni were looking for reliable health information about COVID-19 
and had concerns about the economy, their jobs, and their families' well-being. The university and the UMAA are trusted sources of information for graduates, and we made it easy for them to find what they needed. We launched a resource hub on our website that aggregated the research, podcasts, news stories, and services provided by the many departments across the university. In addition, we added a second weekly email that was focused on delivering COVID-related information alumni needed right then. From SIDRAP News to UMAA webinars on career topics, alumni found this service to be extremely valuable and more than 50,000 alumni opened and read that information weekly. The UMAA plays an important role in promoting the university's excellence and delivering relevant news and resources to the alumni. It's the right content at the, to the right audience in the right format at the right time. We also wanted to help our community by, during this time by offering face masks with some maroon and gold pride. Through the Minnesota Alumni Market, we, don't, uh, we offered a give one, get one offer where we donate a mask to in-health Fairview for each mask purchased. Through the generosity of our alumni and corporate par partners, we are donating over 13,000 masks that will help patients with and their families. Next slide, please. And while our engagement has been primarily virtual, that hasn't slowed down our legislative advocacy efforts. Minnesota 201, UMAA's statewide advocacy network continues to grow with 130 members representing 74 house districts. These alumni made 366 high quality contacts, including in-person meetings, original emails, phone calls, and more. Board Chair Laura Moret and I wrote an op-ed supporting the university's capital request that was published in MinPost. And we also penned a letter to the governor and legislative leaders prior to the start of special session. Next slide, please. In May, as our state and country reacted to the horrific death of George Floyd, the alumni once again raised their voices. This time to stand against racism and call for justice. The Black Alumni Network, the UMAA, the Multicultural Alumni Network, the Muslim Alumni Network, and the Pride Alumni Network all issued public statements expressing anger over the killing of George Floyd and affirming our commitment to fighting racism and unequal treatment in every form. The UMAA published an ever-growing body of resources to help alumni learn more about combating racism and provide ideas for how they can help. It highlights statements from President Gable and other university leaders, faculty research, and community organizations that are working towards justice and equity. As the university's work on anti-racism, diversity, and inclusion continues, the UMAA will partner with the U to amplify those efforts while continuing to be a resource for alumni who want to bring about change. Next slide, please. The UMAA's partnership with the university is strong. We are proud of President Gable's leadership and the university's work to address the most challenging issues of our time and fulfill its land grant mission. With the Board of Regents approval of a new system-wide strategic plan, the university is well positioned to elevate its impact and the UMAA sees opportunities to engage and support those six commitments. From bolstering student success as mentors to acting as advocates and ambassadors and finding entrepreneurial ways to grow resources, the UMAA is innovating and building on its 116 year history as we plan for the future. We look forward to working with President Gable on the plan's implementation and tapping the talent and loyalty of the alumni to support the university's goals. And as we look to the future, we are grateful to have Mark Jessen as the new chair of the UMAA Board of Directors. A 1986 CLA graduate, Mark is the owner of Jessen Press and co-founder of Jessen Media. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thank chair you, Lisa. Powell. Yeah, Mark, welcome. Thank you, Chair Powell, President Gable, members of the Board of Regents. I'm honored to serve as the UMAA's 82nd board chair. For many of us, the University of Minnesota is a family affair. Multiple generations of my family have been educated here, including my siblings, a son who's a Duluth grad, uh, my daughter Kelly, who just graduated with the class of 2020 and started graduate school in CEHD, and a son who was entering his sophomore year. In the fall, Kelly and I had the honor of speaking at the UMAA's first Gopher Families Brunch during Parents Weekend. 
students and their Gopher family member proudly gathered together to celebrate the family tradition of attending the university. The event sold out, and when we can host large gatherings again, we'll need to move it to a bigger room. Next slide, please. This spring, our attention turned to supporting the class of 2020. It's been inspiring to watch the resilience of our students and the deep caring expressed by alumni who want to support them. The alumni stepped up to help ensure that this milestone was special with several initiatives. We invited alumni to share messages of congratulations with graduates. Nearly 200 alumni responded, including Lieutenant Governor Penny Flanagan, uh, Dessa, and uh, Regent Kenyanya, and their messages have been viewed more than 5,000 times. We promoted a congratulations to our new grad yard sign sold through the Minnesota alumni market. More than 500 families are now displaying their U of M grad pride from home. We hosted virtual events leading up to the university's system-wide commencement, including a trivia night and a virtual send off. We supported their career goals with more than 3,600 alumni offering to help students through the Maroon and Gold Network the Alumni Association's free career advice and mentorship platform. We invite alumni to post job and internship opportunities on Gold Pass, the university's digital career center. More than 1,100 alumni have posted jobs this year. And we hosted webinars on topics geared towards helping graduates have a smooth transition into life after college, such as Financial Wellness 101, Job Search Strategies, and Conquering the Virtual Interview. Speaking as both a graduate of this incredible institution and as a parent, I can confidently say that although these newest members to the alumni family have graduated into multiple once in a century challenges, thanks to their U of M education, they're well prepared to thrive and in fact, play a leading role in crafting a path forward. This concludes our report and we're happy to answer questions to hear your thoughts on how alumni can continue to support the university. Thank, Thank you. you very much uh, for that report um, uh, to all of you. Before I turn it over and, and open it up for discussion, I do. I really just want to uh, once again thank Laura for her leadership in the past year. We are so grateful to you uh, for chairing the board. And Mark, we very we welcome you. And uh, uh, we we uh, we all hope that uh, 2021 is a little less exciting. Uh, fingers mm -hmm. crossed. We'll we'll see. But we. You know, we don't take for granted the, the great leadership and board leadership that we have year after year. And we thank both of you for serving. So um, with that, um, I know that we're gonna have questions and comments from, from the board. And let me just look and see here. Um, it, looks like, uh, it looks like Regent Beeson would like to kick us off. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> thank you presenters. And Ms. Moret, thank you for your work, <coughs> excuse me, in service over the past year. Um, and uh, Lisa, thank you for everything you've done and continue to do. It strikes me as one of the largest organizations around that is a membership group, this whole movement toward virtual and uh, digital really sort of moves, um, enhances, uh, our ability and our impact as we go forward. You know, people are isolated and are desperate to, for content and for <coughs> um, contact. And, um, uh, you know, organizations that are large like ours, I think are able to respond and, you, and we certainly have done that through the examples that you've, uh, you've given. Um, but in a, it's sort of ironic that uh, this crisis and uh, how organizations are going to thrive and pivot into this new normal. I think the alumni associations really has the right mindset and um, and um, uh, ability to do that. So I'm excited to go forward. I think it will be it will be um, it'll um, it'll be a great year next year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your service, Chair Moret, um, and welcome incoming Chair Jessen, uh, as well as President Lewis. Um, I had a question in terms of um, what you're hearing from alumni. I think, um, you know, whenever we're making decisions, we talk about all our stakeholder groups, student, staff, faculty, 
from the different campuses and all that. We also talk about alumni, uh, which is a group that's a bit harder to capture um, in, in the nature of them. So if, if you had to pick um, any of you, what, what do you hear from alumni in terms of what, maybe, maybe two things, what, what they're happy to see the university become and maybe something else that they, you know, they long for the good old days when the university used to be this way, um, for lack of a better way to put it. And I'll let anyone take that one. So yeah, President Lewis, maybe if you wanna take a shot at that and anyone else who wants to jump in. Sure, um, Chair Powell and Regent Kenyanya, thank you for the question. Um, throughout uh, COVID-19, one of the things that we resoundingly heard as feedback was how proud they were of the university and how proud they were of the faculty um, and how quickly it responded from President Gable's very quick and decisive leadership that you talked about at the beginning of this meeting um, to the faculty, to the resources that we have. We talk about the importance of the breadth of the institution and all the different academic disciplines and how that is such a, a unique benefit of this institution. And you saw that play out in COVID-19 and our response to that. So uh, we heard a lot of feedback on that. Um, in terms of you know, other comments, um, we're constantly listening and I think that's important. We heard from alumni um, around the statements around George Floyd and um, his death. And so we did get feedback um, from the alumni on that. Many were pleased with the um, statements that the UMAA made and the stance that uh, President Gable has taken in terms of leadership on that as well. But I'm happy to, you've got two, uh, our two great leaders here. So I'm happy to turn that over to either of them as well. Yeah, any comments, uh, Laura or Mark? I, I would share Lisa's comment uh, uh, about the COVID-19 response, both the leadership of the university and I think the pride that alumni have in the research that is going on there. Uh, we often talk about being a research university, but this is an example of why that is so important to our state and our country. So that, that really came through loud and clear over the last three months. Thank you. I, I would just echo that um, both of those uh, observations on the COVID and uh, also on, um, on the systemic racism and the responses we've gotten from a lot of alumni with that, but also to underline uh, the pride uh, with the football season. We just heard from so many alum during the football season and it really helped to draw them in. And um, we did a, a lot on that front. Um, to connect with even more alum and because we were just on the front page of the paper all the time and it really brought people back to the U in a big way. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, I'm going to move on to Regent Rosha who would like to make a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that was a perfect segue. Um, you know, I've had, I guess, going on about three and a half decades of, uh, of a relationship with the Alumni Association in one way or the other. And I'm, I'm just really pleased with where where things are right now in, in, you know, obviously we can overemphasize the impact of sports, but the reality is it, it's, it's very significant and, and particularly for alumni, as we know that oftentimes the success um, that your um, highest profile sports have can have a, a big impact on the, 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 the motivation and, and interest in, in your uh, alumni you know, all the way down to philanthropic giving. And I would just say that I, I wanna congratulate you know, Laura, Lisa, everybody on um, what I thought was absolutely first rate, world class um, uh, opportunities and in, in, in organization at, at the bowl game. Um, you know, having been a part of this for as long as I have, you know, so so used to going to these events where a smattering of Minnesota people show up in Nashville to watch the Music City Bowl and and you know didn't get the the, the enjoyment of beating Alabama. Um, I you know some some of the bowls that I've been at over time where, you know, watching the other side have the turnout and have the events and to think that we are now in the big leagues the way that we are and you know, much credit, of course, to the, to the, the department and, and the coaching staff uh, and, and obviously for the student athletes that have, have, have changed that, that culture for us, uh, you know, quite quickly and, and um, you know, to, to get us to this point. But I just thought what you did was fantastic. And, you know, we've always had this challenge where if we had an, you know, the identical record with another uh, Big Ten school or another, uh, you know, big D1 program, Power 5 uh, school, we would always be at a little bit of a disadvantage because we didn't travel. 
and, and you guys have in, in your relationship with the alumni and your focus on this, I think has really been substantial. And uh, the fact that we had the turnout that we did, I think bodes well um, for our ability to, to be an attractive candidate. Um, of course, it doesn't matter when we're playing in the, in the playoff. We don't, you know, we don't have to have them pick us for that. We'll just go and win ourselves a national title. But it, it, again, without focusing too much on the sports aspect, this is something where I thought you, you guys stepped up phenomenally and, and I congratulate and thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, we have one more Regent who would like to comment, uh, Regent Hur. Sarah, do we have uh, I mute. Have yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry, I am muted. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just uh, thanking uh, Lisa for her leadership and also um, for, for Laura and Mark for stepping up. And I really hear the, your, your message of positivity um, and, um, and pride in the university, and, and that shows through and really helps um, us deliver our message um, to our constituents. So thank you for your work. And uh, I... Lisa, I just want to uh, take this moment to uh, really um, let you know that I want to be of service to you. Um, I was thinking of in my past travels, I, I, last year I was in Europe and in China and also uh, uh, in Greece, and I really love meeting people. And so I, I think as board members, if we travel, um, just to connect with you to say, is there one or two alumni in those countries? That we can hang, that we can have a conversation with, um, even if, even if traveling um, uh, in in the United States. So that thought came to my mind, and I just wanted to extend that that hand out to you to say that I'm interested in in doing something like that. So I'll follow up with you, but just wanted to uh, insert something here. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, listen. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for your great work, and the, I think the the uh, message. Um, that you're giving us today about the, the pride uh, in the university. I mean, it's coming through very strongly in your words and your voice, and it's, it's, it's a great message to hear. And we, we always look forward to, to hearing from you, and we look forward you know, to hearing again from you more soon and you know, hopefully under a situation that's getting a little easier. So thank you all for your report. Thank you so for now, inviting us. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So now we'll move on to the next item. Uh, the committees did not meet this month, so we have no committee business uh, for, for item 10. Uh, that brings us to old business. Uh, any old business to come before the board? And if there is, uh, use raise hand. And I don't see any old business. Uh, is there any new business to come before the board? Okay, looks like there's no business. Before I adjourn, uh, Ms. Dirksen uh, is gonna make a few uh, important housekeeping announcements. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Regents, you had all previously received the Zoom link information for your retreat, which convenes at 12.30 today. Uh, please disregard the earlier Zoom information. Maggie Flotten has sent an email to the full board with new Zoom links. Please look for that in your email inboxes and use those updated links. If you haven't received that email or you can't find it, please contact Maggie Flotten and she will give you the links you need. So just want to make sure everybody understands not to use the previously sent Zoom links for your 1230 retreat. All right, thank you, Ms. Dirksen. Uh, with that, um, uh, with this meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned.